I am now in my late sixties. The experience I'll briefly relate here took place on the southern Gold Coast in Queensland in 1984. Our house was less than 10 years old, as were all the others in the area. At the time the event took place, I was divorced and lived in the house with my two young children. I am neither a drinker of alcohol, nor a user of drugs. They have never been a part of my life. I had no interest in fairies, goblins, gnomes, elves, or the like, nor have I been reading about them or watching anything about them on TV. If asked if I believe in the little people, I would have unhesitatingly replied no. In 1984, I attended a seminar in New Zealand, along with several dozen other Aussies. I'd recently developed a fear of plane travel, although previously I'd enjoyed it. A local chemist whom I knew had given me three or four tablets to take an hour before departure to settle my nerves. I took one prior to our departure from New Zealand. Consequently, I slept from New Zealand to Sydney where we changed planes. And I slept from Sydney to Brisbane, and slept through the drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. The driver, a colleague, carried my suitcase into my home. He conducted a cursory check on the premises before departing. My children were all in the care of a neighbour. It was very rare to have a night to myself. Being well rested and relaxed, I was looking forward to spending a few hours reading or watching TV. First I made a cup of tea. The television was on, the front main door was open, but the security screen catch was locked. As I sipped the tea, I decided I may as well unpack. I carried an armload of clothes into my bedroom and hung them in my wardrobe. I noticed the light in the room seemed unusually bright. Something was strange about the atmosphere. I had no time to analyse it before I was overcome with exhaustion so intense that I'd only had time to stagger backwards into bed. I lay face up on the bed. I was concerned my shoes might make a mark on the bedspread. I looked down to make sure only my heels were resting on the bedspread, and that was that. I lost consciousness. Next I knew I could hear the sounds of several voices. They were argumentative voices that seemed to tell each other to hurry. I managed to lift my head and look down to the source of the voices. There were several small people. They were trying to pull me from the bed, feet first and into the wardrobe. The wardrobe was only half a metre approx from the foot of the bed, and I saw that the left hand side of the wardrobe was open. The wardrobe had two sliding doors. I'd hung the clothes on the right hand side, which had required both wardrobe doors to be pushed to the left. And now, the little people were trying to pull me into the left hand side, which would have required someone to push both doors to the right. I should explain here that during the event, I must have been operating similar to a video camera, in that I saw and heard only, and what I saw and heard must have been committed to memory. At the time, however, I did not experience normal thought process. So what I remembered after, and now, is the product of my mental video camera. At the time, it did not dawn on me that the doors had been moved. I simply saw several small people trying to pull me from the bed and into the open half of the wardrobe. I experienced no shock or alarm. Instead, I told myself I had lots of time to continue sleeping, because I was far too big and heavy for them to move very far. Now, I am of the opinion those thoughts were not my own, but were in some way suggested to me. Whatever the case, I must have lost consciousness again, because the next thing I can remember is waking up to find several people crowded around me. They didn't speak as far as I know. I was now lying with my head at the foot of the bed, so my feet must have been at the head of the bed. Again, I was similar to a video camera. I have very clear memory of how these people appeared. There were males and females, I can't remember how many but at least six or more. One, a male, was larger than the others and appeared to be their leader. He was closest to me. At first he stared into my eyes with both of his. 
Then, a blank, and his position had changed, and he was looking at me with only one of his eyes. Something happened there, but I can't remember. I suspect he was imparting something to me. The creature appeared as the typical gnomes or peasants from storybooks. Based on the height of the bed, their height was perhaps two to three and a half feet tall. They were overdressed. Their clothing was suited to a much colder climate. I can remember that in considerable detail, possibly because in those days I did a lot of home sewing. They were Caucasian, their skin looked weathered as if they worked outdoors a lot, and their skin had a muddy cast. They had strong facial bones, wide cheekbones, wide jaws, strong chins and noses. Their eyes and mouths were long horizontally but vertically narrow and seemed recessed between the strong facial bones. The best way to describe their faces is as squashed, as if a heavy weight had been placed on top of their heads, squashing them downwards. Their bodies were stout, robust, with deep cut chests, broad waists and strong shoulders. I couldn't see the bottom half too well, and I must have lost consciousness again because when I saw them next, I was still in the same position, but they were now in the center of the room looking at me. I looked back at them and still felt no fear nor alarm. I just looked at them and they at me. I had no thought process at the time. There seemed to be more of them than before. Among them were a couple of younger males who seemed a bit more nervous or unsure. The other men were impassive. The women, however, seemed to enjoy my predicament. Based on my mental video recording, I later regarded them as overworked, joyless, and not overintelligent. It seemed I was simply a job to them, and they seemed a bit nervous. Next, I was aware of their voices again. As before, querulously talking over the top of each other and arguing to hurry. I raised my head, and to my alarm, I saw that they'd almost succeeded in pulling my legs from the bed. My body was now right way up on the bed, with my head against the head of the bed and my feet near the wardrobe. When I'd seen that they almost pulled all of my legs from the bed, a surge of adrenaline shot through me, and I grasped that it couldn't be much longer before gravity did the rest of the job for them. All they'd have to do would be to steer my falling body into the wardrobe. I yelled out and kicked at them. Then I jumped from the bed and into the centre of the room. The room seemed far too bright, and I remember standing there yelling at them. I still wasn't afraid, I was angry. They muttered between themselves, and they looked and sounded resigned and bitter. Then they fled into the open half of the wardrobe. They seemed to go in, then down, as if filing down a ramp inside the wardrobe. I stood there watching them for probably a few seconds, then, still, with the light seeming far brighter than usual, I turned towards the only door and left the room. It was only a small house, the hallway was only three or four meters long, and I left the room, went through the hallway towards the living room, and that's when I became completely consumed with terror. Nothing happened between yelling at the creatures and making it towards the living room. But in those few seconds, I was overtaken by sheer horror, which seemed to escalate with every instant. I've never known fear like it, yet there was no real reason for it. I suspect now that when the creatures departed, they removed whatever calming influence they'd subjected me to during the ordeal itself. After phoning the colleague who dropped me off earlier that evening, I stumbled out of the house and into the middle of the road. I was desperate to be with someone and was moaning in the hopes that someone could come and rescue me. I was completely without shame, and must have been reduced to the level of a small child, but I must stress that I wasn't afraid, consciously at least, that the little creatures would return and attack me. There wasn't a real focus for the terror, it just was. Horror feeding into more horror. Not long after, my colleague returned and drove me to his house. He didn't speak to me, I didn't care, I was just glad to be with someone and to be getting away from my house. When we arrived at his place, I got into bed but couldn't get warm. 
He put a pile of blankets on top of me, but I was still freezing. Now I realize I was in shock. I wouldn't let him leave the room or turn off the lights. I must have fallen asleep. When I awoke, he wasn't there. Next morning, he wouldn't discuss any of it. I was anxious. He thought I'd gone insane and tried to explain what happened. He didn't want to talk about it, but he did say that he'd never seen anyone as terrified as I had been when he saw me in the road. We never discussed it again. Despite that, we married the following year. When I asked him how long had elapsed between when he dropped me off after our return from New Zealand and receiving my phone call asking to come and get me, it seemed the entire experience of the little people had been no more than 15 minutes. In approximately 2004, I decided to submit an account of the experience in the 20 years which had elapsed. I had searched in the hopes of discovering others that had had similar experiences without success. There was no internet then, of course, so I was reliant on books. I found only one mention in a book by Jenny Randalls, who said 7% of aliens had been described as looking like gnomes. It was a relief to discover. I was not alone in my experience although I did not believe the creatures I'd seen to be an extraterrestrial. When I decided in 2004 to leave a record of my experience somewhere, I didn't know where to submit it. Finally, I chose an organization which was UFO Research Group in Queensland, the QLD. The QLD Research Group replied to say in response to my inquiry, they'd had no record of anyone else having an experience with gnome type entities. They asked if they could publish my account in their forthcoming magazine, and I replied that it was fine, on the condition that my identity not be disclosed. Some weeks later, the research group got in touch with me. They were astounded by the latest developments. They said the day before, a woman in Melbourne had phoned them. She'd been close to hysterical and claimed that gnome-type creatures had been running through her house for a few hours. Her adult daughter was present at the time, and the woman wanted someone to go to her house to rid them of the gnomes. The Queensland UFO Research Group said they told the woman they'd contacted someone closer to her about the situation, which they did. Apparently, the QLD group had contacted the Melbourne UFO Research Group and had given them the woman's contact info. In telling me this, the following day, the research group said it was impossible for the Melbourne woman to have known about my experience, because the QLD group magazine had been delivered to their printer mere hours before the Melbourne woman contacted them. In other words, the QLD magazine hadn't even been printed yet, let alone distributed. The group said they couldn't get over the coincidence, nor could they understand why both the Melbourne woman and I, as I live in Sydney, had contacted a group in Queensland. I said I had most probably contacted them because of my own experience occurred in Queensland. I asked the group to forward me the details of the woman in Melbourne because I was eager to compare notes with her. She was the only other person I knew of who had experienced anything. But when the QLD group replied, it was to tell me that the Melbourne woman had told them she didn't want to be contacted, not by me or anyone else. The Queensland group told me this was often the case. They said people wanted help at the time, but once the situation was resolved, or they'd calmed down, they become afraid their experience will be reported in the media. They're afraid they'll be subjected to ridicule, generally, and particularly by those they know, such as neighbours and employers. My account was subsequently published in the magazine, in hard copy and online. My identity had not been revealed, and I've been identified only as C. Unfortunately, publication of my experience did not succeed in encouraging others to come forward. I am a 32-year-old man. Yet, as I say this in broad daylight, it still haunts me, to the point that merely thinking about it or in this case, sharing the memory, is enough to send chills down my body and make me feel like a terrified child. 
I have only shared this experience with a handful of people over the past 10 years, because of how terrifying of an experience it was. But I feel like it can be therapeutic to get it off my chest and share it with others. Perhaps others have had similar experiences. To tell this story and to give it justice, I have to tell you of an experience that happened three years before the terrifying encounter. Buckle up, this will be long. My name is Joshua, and I live in Arkansas. And in late 2003, near the middle of fall, right before it started getting really cold, my wife and I were invited to camp with a friend of mine and his girlfriend at Sugarloaf Lake in Oklahoma. I say camp, but the actual plan was to meet at Sugarloaf and my friend, Bob, wanted to take me and my wife around to some paranormal places in the Sugarloaf area. So we got there around 7pm. I was driving a white Ford 1996 F-150. Bob was driving a 1980 something white celebrity, which was a really piece of rubbish vehicle. Anywho, it was late, dusk becoming dark, and we all climbed into Bob's car, and he took us around the area, first to an old abandoned house. But other than some raccoons just rustling around, it was a waste of two hours. Then he took us to a graveyard that was supposedly haunted. Again, it was a bust. Then an old church that was run down. Yawn. Nothing. At this point, it was getting close to midnight, and my wife and I were pretty bored. And I spoke up to Bob, saying, Man, this really hasn't been that freaky of a night. That's when Bob smiled saying that he was saving the best for last. He handed me a few Polaroid pictures of a hillside covered in trees in daylight. I asked him what it was, and he asked me if I saw a house or any type of light pole or anything in the picture, to which I replied, no. He took the picture back and said that's because there isn't, and there's no power lines either. About this time, he turned down an old dirt road and passed a small house. Then after that, it was two miles of dirt road with woods on either side of a barbed wire fence, on the other with about two acres of field connecting to a wooded hillside. Nothing to light the night except the full moon above, and the clear starry sky. After what seemed like forever, he stopped the car and told us to all get out. We did as he said. He walked us to the side of the car, where the fence, field, and wooded hillside was. He looked at his cell phone, which his phone and my phone had no signal. This was 03, and this area had no cell towers, but he looked at his phone and it read 1157. He told us all to watch the middle of the hillside. Even in the complete darkness, I could tell that it was the same field and hillside from the picture. Two minutes go by and nothing had changed. Then at exactly midnight, a small flickering light goes off in the middle of the hillside. A chill runs down my back as my wife, Bob and his girlfriend and myself Watch this small light, which to me looked like an old kerosene lantern, begin to move, swaying back and forth. We watched in complete silence for what seemed like several minutes, when I finally spoke up and asked what the story was with this. Bob replied, he didn't know, but locals had told him that at midnight every night, this lantern would light up and sway back and forth through the woods until the sun comes up, and then it disappears. Nobody knew what the story was, 
At the time, I was a 19 year old guy who didn't think anything would scare or hurt me. So since there were no homes around, I yelled out, We see you now. Not so scary with your little lantern. Bob hushed me, but it was too late. My wife screamed and pointed. I was laughing, but my laughter stopped as I looked up to the hillside to see the lantern swaying back and forth, but moving down the hillside towards the field at an inhuman pace. Gliding, it began to speed across the field towards the car. We didn't stick around to see what it was, because within a second, we were in the car flying down the dirt road back to the lake. We looked back, and saw the lantern slowly moving back up the hillside to where it first appeared. The ride back was silent, until Bob spoke up, saying, Crap, I forgot to put gas in earlier, and the only store around is closed. And if we decided to go back out anywhere, it would be best to take my truck until he could get gas in it in the morning, as he only had about half a quarter tank left. I said okay, and a few minutes later we arrived back at Sugarloaf Lake. We had parked by the lake docks, and we dropped my tailgate and sat and spoke about what had just happened. Bob's girlfriend was pregnant at the time, and told him she was hungry. He told her we had brought some snacks, but he said she needed actual food. But since the local store was closed, he asked if he could take my truck to the next town over to get some food because his car wouldn't have enough gas to get us into town. I obliged. We shut our cooler, put the tailgate up and loaded into my truck. I turned the key and nothing happened. My truck was dead. Deader than dead. No ding, no lights, no clicking noise. Nothing. For all intents and purposes, you would think that the alternator was out. This was strange, and after the night we had been through, it made us feel very uneasy. We got out of the truck and popped the hood. We pulled Bob's car around to the front and attempted to jumpstart my truck with his car. This is where it gets even weirder. As soon as we connected the jump cables to his battery and mine, his girlfriend starts his car, and within a second of the cables in between, the connectors start to smoke, and in a flash of fire, they burn up. And within a few seconds, they were nothing more than bits of melted rubber and ash, with only the end clamps still on our batteries. Bob runs and turns off his car engine and we take the clamps off our batteries. We look at each other in the early moon and starlit night. Did I mention there were no light poles around? And we both get a bad feeling at the exact same time, as we suddenly realise we had been hearing a distant noise in the lake that was getting louder. It was like a motorboat. Now, like I said, this was the time of year it was starting to get cold, especially at night. We were bundled up as it was, and we were standing still on land at night. But somebody was out on a boat after midnight? When it had to be chilly, as there's all that wind hitting them. And from the sound of this motor, it was going pretty fast, but we saw nothing. That is until the boat was about 50 yards away, and a very bright spotlight comes on, temporarily blinding us all. Bob and I tell the women to get into his car and lock the doors. I reach into the bed of my truck and give Bob a tire tool, and I pick up another as I work at a tire shop and had all kinds of tools of the trade in my truck. We were standing in front of the vehicles in the middle, the hoods up on both as the boats pull up to the dock, and two heavily bearded men in their 30s to 40s step out of the boat and walk up. It's hard to give an accurate description, as their spotlight was still pointed to us, 
and it covered the men in an eerie shadow whilst blinding Bob and I. They look at us, at our vehicles, and one glances in the direction of the car, at the women, and then back at us, and lets out a small chuckle. You fellas got into some sort of car trouble? One asks as he lights up a cigarette. Yeah, but it's nothing we can't handle, I stammer. The guy with the cigarette sniffs the air and looks down between Bob and I's feet and sees the still smoking ashes of what used to be the jump cable. Looks like it was more than your terrible jump cables could handle. Y'all need some help? We got some tools on the boat. <clears throat> we got some tools on the boat that I think could help fix you guys' problem right up. Then the other man, who had chuckled in the beginning, says, Mm-hmm. Fix them right up. I'm speechless at this moment, and my mouth is probably hanging a gate. I can't remember as the two men walked back to their boat, and we heard what sounds like chains rattling around as we try to make out what they're doing, but the spotlight was so blinding we could barely see. Anyway, the chain noise was enough, and Bob looked at me without saying a word, and we both jumped into his car and drove the hell out of there. For the next few hours, we drove to a populated area of the houses, which wasn't mainly in the rural area we were pretty much stuck in, since we had very little fuel. But we all sat in the car mostly quiet, looking around in all directions in near panic, thinking that at any given moment those men would find us. It had been a very scary ordeal. Bob would turn his headlights on every now and then, thinking he had seen some movement in the dark. After a while, the women fell asleep, and Bob and I spoke about how strange this all was, and he laughed, saying, I told you it would be a scary night. I just didn't know if it would be this sort of scary. At this point, the paranormal lantern wasn't even the main thing freaking me out, but the men never showed, and eventually the morning was on its way, and it was about 20 minutes until sunrise, and Bob asked if I wanted to go see if the lantern really disappears at sunrise. I asked if he was sure he had enough gas to get there, and he said yeah, the local store opens up in about an hour, so that'll be fine. I tell him in that case, then yes. We wake the women up and drive back to the hillside. We get there with about four minutes left of sunrise, and we still see the lantern swaying in the woods. Bob looks at me and I smile, and do the motion for zipping my lips, as we all watch in wonder, as right as the sunrise hits the hills, does the lantern slowly fade away into nothing. After this, we get back in the car and drive back to the lake, feeling safer now. When we get there, there is no sign of the boat, and the hood of my truck is still up, and the doors are still locked. On a whim, I tell Bob I'm going to try and start the truck one more time before he drives us somewhere, where I can get a cell signal and call for help. And I'll be damned. The truck started right up there and then without hesitation. We all went our separate ways, happy to have seen the sunrise and counting our blessings and swearing to leave the paranormal investigating in the area to others and swearing that we never wanted to come back to this area and run into the boat people again. However, all things fade with time, even fear and common sense. Three years later, Bob, who I haven't seen in almost two years at that point, calls me up and says he has a proposition for me. He goes on to tell me he has a group of himself and three other Wiccans who go out and do seances in haunted places and asked me if I'd be willing to film one of their sessions in a haunted place for their records, and that they would even pay for my services. I am no Wiccan, but I've always loved the paranormal. Even after what I went through at Sugarloaf, 
I still had an itch to scratch when it came to getting scared and dealing with the paranormal and the unknown. And I told him yes, I would love to go with them. But I had no interest in joining in, but was okay with watching and just getting to be out there and looking into the paranormal once again. So of course, my next question was, when and where we were going to be doing this? When he answered, I got a terrible gut feeling. And I wish so much that I had trusted my gut and told him that I had changed my mind. Remember that lantern light out near Sugarloaf? As if there were any way I could forget. Yeah? Why? I told my group this story, and they want to do the ritual there and see if we can contact the spirit and find out what it is and why it's there. Bob replied. I don't know, man. Oh, come on, Josh. Trust me, you'll be safe. I'm going to pay you 250 in cash just to sit there and film it. At this time, I was about to become a father. And money was tight due to diapers, formula, and everything involved in being a parent does cost a small fortune. Not to mention it was my first kid and my new wife's first kid. So she had been going crazy spending money on not just the necessities, but also buying only top of the line baby products like toys, cribs, playpen, baby monitors, strollers, car seat, combination packs and play slash changing tables, diaper genie, designer baby clothes. So because my wife was putting us in the poorhouse, I had to weigh out my fear of the area as less important because it's what I needed to make the extra money. So against my better judgment, I accepted the offer. And a week later, I was in the same seat beat down celebrity Bob was driving three years earlier. This time with Bob and two other guys and one girl that were complete strangers to me. They each were dressed very gothic and had these pentagram necklaces. It was 1150 when we got there. And the four of them sat in a tight circle, and I was behind them to the right, about five feet from the barbed fence that was in front of the field that led to the hillside. And my back was to the hillside and bushes at the fence line. And I was filming my friend's circle as they all started chanting something. As I have been sharing this entire post, I have been getting knots in my stomach, knowing that I was coming to this part of the story. This part of the story still haunts my dreams, and even waking hours to this day. I'm going to do my best to describe how the following unfolded. I know that mere words cannot do justice to the pure terror that ensued, or how horribly horrific the events surrounding were. So, when listening to this, turn your imagination all the way up. And believe me when I say, this is a turning point in my life. And I was interested in the paranormal. It was a fun hobby to go out ghost hunting or get myself spooked or whatever. But after this night, I will never look at the paranormal as fun or interesting anymore. Or whatever. But after this night, I never looked at the paranormal as fun or interesting anymore. I just show respect and stay as far away from it as possible, as there is so much dread just trying to share this. As his group are chanting, Bob lights up this huge candle in the middle of them and opens up some sort of book. It's not like a scary antique spell book or anything like that. He starts reciting words from it. And then he looks at his phone and tells the group to be quiet and to look at him. I turn the camera and at midnight on the dot, the lantern appears. One member of Bob's group blurts out, cool. I roll my eyes. Since the way these people were dressed and the way they carried themselves, the word didn't seem to fit into their vocabulary. Then Bob says to his group, to join hands as they attempt to communicate with the spirit. I turn my back to the light and begin to film the group as they began again, chanting, and Bob reads from the book. 
They then start asking questions, in hopes the spirit will respond. About this time, a wind picks up, and Bob's candles go out. He tells everyone to hold on, and tells me to cut the camera for a minute, and I oblige, and stop recording as I watch Bob as he tries with his lighter. Then, two lighters from his group, but none of them are working. I'm sitting down watching the group when I start hearing rustling behind me. I jump up, leaving the camera on the ground and spin around. Bob and his group are preoccupied with their candle and lighter problem, and as I spin around I'm blinded by the brightest light I've ever seen. What I believe was the lantern close up and personal, but as quick as it had appeared the light was gone, and the lantern was nowhere to be seen. If it had been the lantern that blinded me, it had moved from the hillside across the field and right behind me without me realizing it in the span of 30 seconds. I looked around for the lantern on the hillside and nothing. It was a quarter past midnight and the lights have always stayed on the hillside. At this moment, the wind quits blowing and I hear Bob's lighter finally flick and see it light up and I mutter, Uh, guys, did you see that? They all turn and ask what I'm talking about, but before I can answer them we all stopped dead in our tracks by a distant laughter, coming from somewhere, everywhere, and nowhere. It was all around us nearly. And this is no ordinary laughter. This laughter sounds like the laughter of hundreds even thousands of children to haunt me at this very moment. As I'm recounting this, I recall looking around the room I'm in. Whenever I think or talk about this experience, I can vividly remember that terrifying sound and hear it in my head. Also, it just occurred to me that when you put the letter S at the beginning of the letter, it spells slaughter. Why did I the best way I can describe this laughter is for you to imagine a large group of kids singing row 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 your boat. You know how one kid will start and seconds later another will join? And then, hundreds of thousands of children laughing. As if one would start laughing and seconds later another would, and the pattern went on in an endless loop. I'm not saying the laughter sounded like the song Row 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 Your Boat, I'm saying they sounded in unison, like when the kids sing Row 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 Your Boat together. One would start, then another later would start, and then another later, and the laughter was getting louder and closer. There was sinister laughing, goofy laughing, giggling, and all kinds of laughter coming from all around us. This couldn't be real. This sort of thing does not happen. What the hell was happening? I scream at Bob and his group that we need to get the hell out of there, but they were already running for the car leaving their Wiccan book and candles behind, and without hesitation I run after them and jump into the car just as the laughter is becoming deafening. We haul us out of there and drive about a mile up the road and pull over, as Bob is in no condition to drive and we're all freaking out. We all get out of the car pacing around it, asking each other if we had just really heard what we did. I tell Bob, and that I'm so sorry, because I had left the camera behind. He says he doesn't care, and that he isn't going back for it. At this point I've got my hands on my knees, panting to try and catch my breath, as I have never in my life before been so terrified. That is when all of our chatter stops, as we once again heard the laughter off in the distance, very quietly at first, but slowly getting closer and closer and louder and louder, until once again it's becoming deafening, and we jump back in the car and speed away. We drive about six miles, and for the first three we can still hear the laughter in the distance, with our windows down a little. We all begin to calm down by mile four, when the laughter can no longer be heard, but we have no intention of pulling over, and Bob's friend is in the passenger seat with his phone, waiting for a signal to pop up, as he's about 
on mile six. Bob's friend says he got four bars, and he hands the phone to Bob as he calls a friend of his who is into the occult and well versed an educator in it. And as we are driving, he describes what happened to the lady. Bob told me his friend told him that she believed in the children of the Hector or something like that. I have no idea about what the Hector is, but something like more of a guess to me. Anyway, as Bob is on the phone speeding out of the area, me and the other two people in the back seat all get a chill at the same time. And they told me later that it was just like me on the hair of the back of my neck standing on end and a loud snapping noise coming from the front end of the car and Bobby celebrity stops dead in its tracks and will no longer move forward. He tries everything, but the car is not moving. We later discovered that the tie rod had snapped. Anyway, the friend Bob was talking about on the phone only lived about 20 minutes away from where we were and said that they were on their way. As we sat in the car, nobody spoke after about three minutes until we saw a pair of headlights coming down the road towards us. We knew it was too soon to be Bob's friend, but me and Bob thought maybe we could get a ride from a local and we all unloaded out the car and stood in front of it, waiting for the vehicle to come fully to a stop. Now I cannot be certain, but my gut tells me that I am correct. But the vehicle doesn't stop. But as it comes into view, it's a beat up old pickup truck. And it slows down as in the truck. There are two men in their 30s to 40s, with huge beards. And they stare down at us and speed up after passing by. I look at Bob before we can speak, and he was already thinking, the guys from the boat. Before I can say anything back and see headlights coming from the direction the truck just went. Bob called his friend back and told her to drive like hell and get there now and hung up. Four to five minutes go by and we see headlights coming. Relieved, we get all our stuff ready thinking it was Bob's friend. Then his phone rings. It was the lady who was coming to get us, telling Bob she took a wrong turn and would be at least another 10 to 15 minutes before she arrives. Bob hangs up the phone and watches in terror, as do I, because the same truck slowly passes again, this time with only one of the boatmen in the truck. This time though, the driver starts to crawl by and says, looks like you fellas could use some help, and then speeds up and drives off. This cemented the fact that Bob and I were definitely dealing with the boat guys. But where the hell was the other one? Why wasn't he in the passenger seat? And to make matters worse at this point, something we had almost completely forgotten about due to the boatmen, was immediately reminded to us when we began to hear the laughter again in the distance. All around us like before over the next few minutes, it started to get closer and closer. I'm almost urinating in my pants at the sound as it's getting deafening and we have nowhere to run this time. And then from behind our car off in the distance, we see two sets of headlights coming on and two vehicles coming towards us slowly side by side, taking up the entire width of the backcountry dirt road coming our way. The laughter now seems to be coming from the woods on both sides of the road and we're stuck. And now the laughter is zeroing in on us as if hundreds and thousands of children are within reaching distance of us. There's no wind, no sounds other than the crunch of the tires on the rocky dirt road and the two vehicles that are slowly approaching us. With our last shred of hope fading away into the laughter of the children and the headlights of the two vehicles surely being driven by the boatmen, we are given a reprieve as at the time coming from the other direction, we see another set of headlights coming fast as we hold our breath. The laughter, the boatmen, what could be next? How will we get out of this? And that is when the vehicle that was coming fast pulls up and it's Bob's friend. She unlocks the car and rolls down her window and begins to tell us to get in. When this happens, the two sets of headlights coming from the other direction turn off and Bob's friend says, Oh my God, you weren't kidding about the laughing kid, she screams. 
We begin to tell her about the boat guys, and she turns the car around. And no sooner had she started to drive away, did the two sets of headlights come on again, this time with their brights on, and they go about a car's length behind the car we're all crammed in. We yell to go, channeling my inner Jeff Goldblum, telling her much faster as she floors it for about a mile or two. But the vehicles stay on our tracks. For about the next two miles after that, we can all hear the laughter way off in the distance with our windows down. But after about three minutes, did it subside. To this day, I have no explanation for what happened, what the laughing children were, why they followed us, and if the boatmen were connected to this somehow, or if they were merely a coincidence of that day that were also there to terrify us. And why they did not react to the laughing children sound. Is the lantern connected to the laughing children, or did Bob and his group mistakenly call forth the laughing children through their ritual? Like I said, this happened years ago, but I still feel just as terrified now when I tell people about it or think about it. I have had constant chills and goosebumps as I've tried to share this. So, I'm a bit shaky. To all of you who think the paranormal is just a fun hobby to get your thrills with, I beg of you and warn you that we are not prepared for what is really out there. You think nothing will scare you or harm you, but you are dealing with unknown things. You have no idea how mundane or powerful the paranormal could be. If you use the paranormal as a thrill seeking hobby, just use caution and always have your vehicle checked out beforehand. Oh, and watch out for seemingly psychopathic hillbillies and laughing children. I hope we never meet again. I am 23 now, and the time that this occurred was my first summer out of high school. And me and my three friends, fresh off their freshman year of college, decided to live together. One of my friends, my best friend for years, Earl, had a long-time girlfriend whose father owned the property. It was a decently sized plot of land with several old cabins on it, their house, which was large and out in the back of the woods, and a few other scattered buildings. I think it used to be a campground before he bought it to live on it and run his business out of it. We live in Southern Maine, and the property is heavily wooded. Pine Tree State for the win. The house that we lived in was at the very front of the property right on the road. The owner's house was at the very rear and could only be accessed by a dirt road with two ditches on the side. A one minute walk towards the woods from our front house was a small little cabin across a clearing and it was furnished and powered. In the house was me, Earl, John and Chuck. We all had some different girls and girlfriend pals and partied through the summer. We would frequently come here to the cabin and the owner's house before moving in. Anyway, enough with the scene setting. Some of this story is from word of mouth from the others living in the home, but we have all been friends a long time, and I trust them implicitly, and I witnessed enough myself to know that this all lined up. So, the first encounter was at the very beginning of summer, before we even moved in. It was evening and dark, and everyone was at the owner's house watching a movie. As I slowly drive my car down the dirt path to the owner's, something white and large in size ran in front of my car. It was a blur. It was too fast to really catch what it was. But being in the woods, I assumed it was some kind of albino fox. I shrugged it off and made my way to the house. A week later, we were all situated and moved into the front home by the street, and things were great. I'll admit the front area of the property was spooky, despite being the most open and least wooded. The owner's mother had lived in our house and died years ago. We could see an old statue of Mother Mary off in the woods that was always kind of sketchy. Across the street was a small independent tire shop 
with a small dirt lot. Only thing in the house when we moved in was some kind of antique cheetah statue, which appeared to be from the 60s, tall and skinny in a sitting position, and went up to mid waist. So we put it in the corner of the hallway, thought it was neat and retro. For a few weeks, all was normal. Admittedly, some friends experimented with some different substances, like LSD and salvia once or twice, paired with the normals like drinking. I do not believe this impacted what happened though. We have some parties, invite girls over for some fun, jam out on the guitars in the cabin. It was a great time. But things slowly became tense and went downhill. A lot happens, and I believe that they are all connected even though they seem disjointed and random. After a few weeks of fun, Earl had developed crippling insomnia due to some tooth pain that unfortunately he could not afford to fix. He would clock maybe one hour of sleep per night and slowly became more and more irritable, but nothing too serious. One night, John and Earl and some of their friends, who we will call Don, are out back in the cabin. They had done some slight drinking, but John was a straight edge who never touches anything of any kind. Earl is playing on his guitar and singing some of our original tunes. This portion of the story, until I came into play, is recanted by John. During the night, our fourth roommate Chuck is asleep in bed, while I'm in my room, as Earl plays his guitar and he says to Don, Wow, man, those are some great harmonies you're doing. Since when can you sing? Don looks a little confused and tells Earl that he wasn't singing along. Earl starts singing again, but stops when he hears the harmonies a second time. He thought his ears were tricking him, but John and Don had heard them too. They put the guitar down and decide to investigate. They walk through the clearing briefly, startled by Mother Mary in the woods, until they reach the front of the road. From across the street, they see the biggest white cat they'd ever seen. Not just a cat, but the size of a larger dog or mountain lion. They scramble to try and get a video with their phones, at which point I see them out the window and run down to meet them. As I hit the yard, I'm just stunned as they are and see this giant white bobcat sitting on a hill across the tire shop. It's massive, about the size of a German shepherd. But something was wrong. Its tail. It had a gross, nasty, fleshy tail, as if it had the tail of a rat. It's long, so I can't see all of it. But it's definitely proportionally wrong, and way longer than a normal cat. Let alone, fleshy and bald. Don picks up a rock and throws it at it. I kid you not, all four of us, too fully sober, watching this thing stand up on its hind legs and calmly walk into the woods, dragging its tail behind us, and we book it inside. Earl is more sleepless than normal, trying to drink himself to sleep. He is successful and Don does the same. I don't remember how John and I fell asleep that night. Every creak of the house petrified me. The next morning, we wake Chuck up and thoroughly scare him. We're all kind of on edge for the rest of the day. But with the sun out, the fun starts back up, and we put it to the back of our minds. Today, Earl confides in me about his lack of sleep, and how he does not expect this experience to help. Night comes again and everyone decides to have a low-key evening after all the excitement from the evening prior. That evening, Chuck suffers from his first and only night terror of his life. He's awake in his bed, and he's in some kind of paralysis, and he hears the growls slash snarls slash screams of a cougar-type creature or bobcat as a giant white mass runs across the doorway of his room. He slowly regains movement and comes into my room to tell me what happened. He doesn't sleep for the rest of the night, and the next morning, 
we bring the cheetah statue into the cabin from across the clearing. For another few weeks, nothing tremendous happens. We continue to be on edge, and Earl slips a little further, but things are slowly getting better. I do a little research about what we've seen, cryptozoology, demons and monsters. Finally, I make a breakthrough. I find an article, nothing big, from an old book about main urban legends. The book was from a while ago, and described something called the Dingball Cougar, or Plunkus. It just sounds better as Plunkus. Anyway, I said Dingball was a cougar, whose last tail joint was ball-shaped and bare of hair and flesh. Dingball was fond of human flesh and would sing with a human voice to lure the incautious out of their cabins at night, where it waited in the dark to crack their skulls with its tail. My heart stopped as I read this, because it matched so well with our experience. Mind you, it said nothing of walking on its hind legs or being white, but the similarities still shocked me, and I kept this info on my chest for a while. A few days later, Earl's insomnia came to a head. It would be about 10pm, and I laid in bed before I heard a massive crash. From the audible vantage point I was at, it sounded like someone had fallen down the stairs. I rushed into the hallway as Earl came from his room, and I yelled, What the hell was that? Earl turned to me, and raised his fist and said, Shut up, man, and ran down the stairs. I sat in my room for a minute confused, and after about 20 minutes I went to my car and drove to my parents to spend the night. I stayed the rest of the day with my parents too. That night, Earl called me to apologise. The crashing had come from his room, where he had angrily kicked a chair due to oral pain. And when I came out, he thought I was angrily yelling, what the hell was that, to him. We made up on the phone. And then he asked me something peculiar. Hey man, did you come home today at all? No, why? He explained that he was the last one out, so he had to lock the doors. As we had been for about two weeks since we all started freaking out. Earl had the only key. Okay, and? I asked. He sounded a little scared when he said this. The cheetah statue was on top of Chuck's bed. I told him not to touch it. Even later that night, when I got back to the house, Chuck's room was closed, and we went and took a look. The cheetah had been placed in the center of Chuck's bed, standing up. He had a lumpy mattress, and the fact that it had stood so straight was impressive and unnatural. It was not leaning tilted or anything. As soon as I touched it, it fell over and the next day I took it and hid it somewhere no one else could bother to look for it. In one of the older cabins, where they only use for storage. The thing is, the next night, it was back in Chuck's room. The bed was made up neatly, and the cheetah was placed under the blankets with its head out, as if it were taking a nap. We burned the statue the next day. I wish I could say that solved everything, but it didn't. Over the next few weeks, we continued to be stalked by white blurs in the corner of our vision, the rustling of leaves, and the occasional faint whisper of singing in the distance. At one point, the Mother Mary statue was even turned backwards, no longer facing the home. I'm not sure when, but we only noticed at this point. A few days passed and summer was up, and we all left. We still visit different spots of the property, but avoid that house. We hear the occasional rustle, but we don't watch for colour anymore, because we don't want to see the white blur. After all this, I don't know what the Plunkus is. A beast? A spirit? A demon? All of them? All I know is that Earl never got his tooth fixed. The pain just went away. Chuck has never had a night terror since, and I know that it's still there, and I remember how old and mysterious my state still is. Hell, Stephen King loves it for a reason, right?
To preface, this happened around three years ago, and then one year ago. I was 16 at the time, and religious. I'm currently hitting 20 and I'm still semi-religious, and still completely unsure of what the hell happened. Anyway, every year, the church I attended held camps over the summer and winter months. One for children, and one for high school aged kids, of which I fell into the latter category. The camp is held in Arrow Bear Mountain area of Southern California, close to Big Bear, so we're really not that far from the nearest city. The first few days and nights are completely uneventful. We had a great time being kids and hanging out with friends in the mountains. But the last two days is where things got intense. The first event happened when the camp counsellor of our group, who was in a particular grade in high school, and I was going into junior year as I graduated early, says that we should all go out for a Bible study at night. So it sounds like fun. We gear up for a small hike, and set out at around 10pm. We go for a while, and as we near the spot where we were all to settle down, we hear some noises consistent with medium sized branches falling into the forest. Now, branches fall all the time, but they seemed really frequent. I didn't really pay any attention to it, but after what happened next, it might be relevant. We sit down on a large rock, my back towards the forest. The group was about 15 kids and one adult counsellor. About three quarters of the way into the study, my friend and I hear noises from behind us. Large, cracking noises. It sounded like someone or something was throwing big rocks into trees. Weird, but maybe it's just one of the group. Then the noises grew louder, and everyone heard it. And then nothing. The group finishes its study and begins to pray. I hear a soft rustling noise behind me once more, but nothing too strange for the woods, until the hairs on the back of my neck stand up straight. This intense feeling of dread and fear came over me. I couldn't move, and I wanted to scream, but I didn't know why. Finally, I managed to turn around very slowly, and what I saw changed me forever. There I saw a creature. At first, all I saw were two red floating orbs, divided by uneven geometric shapes like an insect. And in those eyes, I saw pure and horrifying hatred. I knew that whatever this thing was, it wanted me dead. The creature was darker than the already pitch black woods behind me, but slowly its edges became more visible, like a red film came over it, and I knew it wanted me to see it. It had the basic anatomy of a canine, but its head was deformed and disgusting. There were open sores, and clumps of fur missing. I couldn't move, except for to nudge my friend. He, far less religious than I, just screamed, what the hell, in the middle of group prayer. This creature laughed at us, and with one backwards movement was gone. But I knew he was close by. How? I don't know. Fast forward to departure day. My friend and I still have no idea about what it was, and the priest at camp didn't want to jump to any conclusions, since nobody but my friend and I actually saw it. He didn't know what to think. As we boarded the bus and sat down, I felt watched. I looked back in the general direction of the vent, and I know that it was letting me know it was there, like a goodbye kind of thing. And then, it was gone. Two years later, this being last year, I see it again. 
I have been going every year since, and was even a counsellor at this point. It was at the high school camp, where I was part of the staff at the same location. Again, the second to last day we're there, it happened. We were on the main grounds about a mile away from the first encounter. I'm sitting by the fireplace, talking to a cute staff member and just chilling. When I get the original feeling again, dread. She must have felt it too, because she bolted upright and started praying, partially in tongues. Basically, for those unfamiliar with the term, it's when one who is engaged in speaking for spiritual reasons, begins speaking in an entirely, sometimes unintelligible language, often seen as a gift by some Christian denominations. I look into the dark forest down the hill, and there he is again, under a light post, and in my mind I hear, hate, hate. Why can't you die? The creature was stomping his front paws and trembling with rage. At this point, I'm flipping out. I don't know what the hell is going on or why this is happening. And I begin to question my sanity. This can't be real, can it? The girl I was with grabs my arm and holds me close. The being I saw before howls a disgusting guttural noise and bolts up a hill, and I lose sight. I look at her and I ask her if she saw it too. She said, no. I just felt like I had to start praying, but I didn't see anything. She paused for a second and said that she heard a name, but she didn't really hear it. But... It was like a sixth sense. Hatred and rage. Well, that makes sense. Fast forward one more to the last night, and the girl and I have gotten close. We're friends, but we also have a bit of a spark between us. We're sitting at the soccer field holding hands and just relaxing after a physically exhausting day of sports and hiking. The camp is a great place, not just for kids, it's tons of fun, but I digress. The sun has long set, and we're looking at the stars, googling constellations, and astronomical stuff on our phone. And then I start crying. At once, I felt depressed and hopeless, and I wanted to cry until I couldn't anymore. I forced myself to look around, and I saw a very disheartening sight. Hatred was back, and he brought a friend. This thing was even more horrid than the first one. It was physically larger than the first creature, but its head looked to be slapped on there, like the original head was ripped off and replaced with this one, akin to a bug but even creepier, was at the point of the neck where it looked like it was ripped off. There were tentacles, not like octopus or anything. It's indescribable. There's nothing I can link them to. All I hear is, yes, over and over. And I knew it was the second creature. The girl I was with is dead still and I know she sees it. She starts whispering a prayer. We need to go. Oh my God, we need to leave. And she says to me, his name is Sorrow and Despair. Hatred, the first creature, bolts off, while Sorrow just calmly walks away, taking his sweet time. As he left, I slowly regained my emotions and made a beeline to the pastor's cabin. At this point, he believes me, and thinks it was probably a demon. My friend who was with me in the first encounter has turned to drugs, and his whereabouts are unknown, though he's definitely close to home. One of my friends will see him around, and he looks decently fed and clean. I don't really think it was because of this incident. And the girl mentioned, while we never dated, she still remains a good friend. 
she usually refuses to talk about it as it freaks her out. But remember it, she does. I don't know what happened, and you may not believe me, but I give you my word, this is true. All of it. Was it a ghost? A demon? I don't know. I didn't believe in either until now. I honestly have no clue. Part of me says I'm crazy, and the other part of me thinks I should just forget about it all. But I just needed to tell someone. I must preface this with a few things. This encounter is second hand, but was told to me on multiple occasions by the person that experienced it. I am a natural skeptic and cynic, so I can't say that I 100% believe it, but his telling of it was pretty simple yet concise, and did not vary between the retellings. I've known this guy for many years, and his advice and input on just about everything is well reasoned and always helpful. So I'll just try to take his word on it, even if with a grain of salt. So let's get down to business. My friend Marv likes to go solitary camping on occasion, to be at one with nature. He is also an avid gun collector and enthusiast. I don't remember exactly when he said that this took place, but it was a few years back, and he decided to go camping on a whim. He packed his gear, a few guns, a hunting rifle, and a .45 sidearm specifically and headed out into the country onto a vast swatch of property owned by a friend of his. He had full permission in the works. This happened close to the Kisachi National Forest, in south slash central Louisiana. He liked to hike in pretty deep, and camp at specific spots that he found a few trips prior. These details are kind of sparse, as it's not really the meat and potatoes to this encounter. So he made his way in, and set up camp in his usual small clearing for the night. Skipping ahead a few hours, it was now late afternoon, when he heard leaves crunching and twigs being stepped on. He assumed it was an animal at first, and got up from cooking something on the fire to try and get a look. He gazed in the direction of the noise, and saw a man approaching through the trees a good many yards away. He has described his etiquette for dealing with other people in very remote places as always being cautious, as more often than not, the people he comes across are armed like him. He tries to stay friendly, but he still keeps his guard up, looking for any ulterior motives as you can never tell what some folks are up to in the middle of nowhere. He'll make chit chat with them, find out generally what they're up to if he can, and occasionally share a meal. He's never really met anyone nefarious as of yet, other than this situation, and maybe one other, but that's a different ordeal. So one thing that sets off small alarm bells for him is that he knows he's the only one with permission to be on this property. And secondly, this guy is not dressed for the location. He says the guy was wearing a white t-shirt, blue jogging shorts, and white socks and sneakers. Mind you, Marv is miles out in the middle of the woods, away from any paths, roadways, houses, or anything really. Nobody is going to casually stroll into his current location dressed like that, unless they are lost or confused. It was early fall, but not quite cool, very normal for Louisiana. So there's a ton of mosquitoes, ticks, and other insects aplenty. You're not going to have most of your skin exposed if you can help it deep in the woods. I know that all too well from personal experience myself. So Marv assumes something might be up and calls out, Hey, do you need help with something? 
He says it quite loudly, definitely loud enough to be heard. The guy, however, keeps walking, staring directly at him. Marv is starting to get unnerved. And as I said, I know this guy well, and he is as cool as a cucumber in a tense situation. Getting more uneasy, as the guy is closing the distance, he gets to his feet and loudly declares, Hey man, can I help you with something or what? The guy is now 10 to 15 feet away, standing at the edge of the clearing in the forest. The guy looking at Marv dead in the eye speaks and clearly says, Help me. Marv said he was already starting to actually get worried at this point, because he said the way the guy said this was as if something that didn't exactly know how to talk was saying help me. Or at least, that's how he first thought of it. It just didn't sound right. The guy still unmoving says, help me, again, but this time more emphatic, and just really loud. Marv said, this is when he was picking up on what was truly wrong about this. He said the timbre of his voice was more female and actually sounded like a recording being played back and that the guy's lips and mouth movements weren't matching up with the phrase. It was like he was just opening his mouth, emitting the phrase and closing it again. Marv asked, what do you need help with? Not daring to back up or move it whatsoever. The guy still standing motionless was staring directly at him and said, help me, again, and repeated the phrase another three times slowly, but not louder in volume. Marv, now totally unsure of what the hell is going on, interrupts the guy by barking, all right, you need to go now unless you actually need my help. Do you need my help or not? He continues loudly and firmly in tone. The guy didn't miss a beat, and started up with the help me's again, and made it as if to take another step in Marv's direction. Marv told me, that's when he did the only thing that made sense in the moment, and drew his .45 semi-auto pistol, and pointed it at the guy telling him that he needed to go. The guy started to get more animated, and agitated, actually starting to say the phrase louder, over and over, but not stepping closer or backing away. Marv did what he thought was right given his current predicament, assuming he was dealing with an unstable or potentially dangerous individual and discharged a round into the ground in front of the guy. Now this is where it gets crazy. I'm not kidding. As the guy stops uttering the phrase, he goes silent and is still staring at Marv full on. He backflips and somersaults into the woods and immediately out of sight. Yes, you heard that right, just like a gymnast. Now I know what you're thinking because I had the same reaction. This sounds completely made up for sure, but Marv gave me no indication of falsehood and told me this on multiple times each time in a dead serious demeanor. Yet, Marv said the guy backflipped away effortlessly, as if pulled by an unseen tension coil. He described it as completely humanly unnatural and totally out of place. The guy had just appeared and repeated the same phrase over and over, eventually almost becoming frantic, before Marv shot at the ground, causing him to flee, in the most peculiar manner. Marv said he stood there focused on the forest where the guy just flipped into, and saw and heard no further movement. It was like the guy had never been there. He stayed like this as the sun began to set, and the normal night noises crept in. As I mentioned before, Marv is a pretty unshakable fellow, and actually stayed in the area for the night, and next night, before returning with no further incident. When he has told me and some other friends about this, of course we ask many questions. We prod him to elaborate on the guy's speech sounds. He said the more he thought about it after the incident, 
the more he was sure it was definitely a female's voice coming from the guy. It was almost like he slash it had heard someone say it and mimicked it like a parrot or any other talking bird would. Almost like a lure. He doesn't know what it wanted and didn't give any indication to follow or utter anything else. It reacted immediately to the gunshot and you know what follows there. He's been back to the property since with no other strange occurrences. The only other minute detail that I can think of is that he did remember hearing during the early morning of the first night, what sounded like a gunshot off in the distance. And it did sound eerily similar to his 0.45. He thought he may have heard it again on the hike back. There are people that hunt in the area. And of course, it could have just been that. So he couldn't be sure. Since this incident, and one other he had in a completely different location, he did some online research of the whole Kisachi area, and found many legends, stories, and supposed encounters dealing with skimwalkers, and other unnerving bits of Native American folklore in the area. Not to mention mimics and other similar supposed creatures. A lot of his encounters line up with these tales. But there's nothing tangible to prove it. But even as a skeptic, it does make me wonder about strange things in the remote and untouched areas of the world that can't be explained. First, some background. I'm a 22 year old college senior about to graduate and start medical school in the fall. This happened when I was in elementary school. So over a decade ago. Over the summer, way back then, my mum sent me to YMCA summer camp. I enjoyed going in every day and hanging out with all my friends from school who also went to the camp. But I especially loved one of the counsellors, Mike. Mike was always sitting in the same spot when I got dropped off in the morning. And he would see me walk in and put a huge smile on his face. He would always sit there and play cards or some other board game in the morning while all of the kids were arriving. Once the day's scheduled activities started, Mike would always be the counsellor in charge of my group. He would always just be close to me. As a kid, I didn't know that was weird. I really liked him as I said, and I thought he was a really cool guy as an eight year old. Fast forward a few years, my mum, my younger sister and I were out at a skate park in the area, about a half hour from where we lived. We had gone down there to hang out for the day. We have a great time on the playground, walk around the trails and stuff. And then we head back to the car. When we arrive back, my mum was getting my sister all strapped in and ready for the ride home. And I was getting situated in the back seat of the car. Now our car was in the parking lot. And there weren't really a ton of people at the park that day. The lot was pretty much empty. So when I noticed that there was a car parked right next to our car, I thought, that's weird. But again, I was a kid and didn't really think anything of it. Why would this car park literally right next to us when I can see 50 empty spots from right here? Anyway, my mum is getting my sister and I'm all ready for the trip back home. Suddenly, the driver door of the other car opens and out pops Mike. My mum recognized him so she said hi and continues back to what she was doing. Mike says, do you mind if I take a couple of pictures of the kids? He's gotten so grown and I want to remember this. My mum goes, no, you're not going to do that and shuts the driver's door and locks the car and we leave. As we're leaving, I can see Mike trying to take a photo through the window of the car. A few years later, when I was a bit older, my mum told me a few more details about Mike. My mum at the time was pretty high up in a company that pairs kids with adult mentors. Adults would be applied to be paired with kids. So my mum starts telling me 
about how one day when they were going through the applications to be a mentor, Mike's name popped up. Apparently someone else had interviewed Mike and recommended him for approval into our system. My mum on the other hand, essentially vetoed it, because she obviously had known Mike from these other experiences, and she got a weird vibe from him and thought something was off. So finally we're watching the news at dinner one day a bit later. They start sharing a story about a man who was arrested, and they show a mugshot of Mike. The charge? Thousands of images. Thousands of indecent images of underaged children that both he had made and was in possession of. He was actually caught by border patrol as he was acting weird when he was trying to cross into Canada and they decided to search his car and they found a bunch of it on his computer. They alerted the US authorities who then searched his house and they found tons more. I'm 100% confident that he wanted to add me to the collection. If it's not for my mum having a great mother's instinct and the Canada US border, it might have happened. Summer camp counsellor Mike, please, let's never meet again. I had pet rabbits as a kid. They lived outside in a cage, a really big cage inside a bigger shed, which was pretty nice for rabbits and it had heating and everything. I got home late from something, maybe a family party. I went out with my older sister to feed them, and at the time we were about five and seven. On the way to the cage, we both saw what appeared to be a really tall thin man running inhumanly fast through our backyard. We live in what is basically a swamp, and he had to have cleared this giant down tree and run through mud and ferns. But regardless, he seemed to be going over 15, maybe even 20 miles per hour. We both dropped what we had and bolted back inside. At the time, our parents were able to convince us it was a deer or something. We wanted to believe it, so we convinced ourselves that it was. I convinced myself for over a decade of what we saw. But fast forward to a few years ago, I was at a park near my house with a friend late at night. I pulled into the dirt road drive in my outback and parked facing the old practice field. It was far too foggy to see across the field, except for a split second, where we could see what appeared to be a very tall man running across the field. We drove as fast as that Subaru could take us, drifting out of the park. Now, a year or two ago, I was at the same park, under similar circumstances. This time it was clear but very windy. From across the field and into the field, we heard a crash and a scream. Not a crash, then a scream, they were simultaneous. It was the most shrill, terrifying, god-awful screech I'd ever heard. More human than a fisher cat, but far louder and more shrill than even a woman. We noped out of there as fast as we could. There was also one other thing that happened. Anyway, this was when I was a sophomore in high school, around the same time of the first encounter at the practice field from the previous story. I was at my friend Nick's house, with a couple of other friends, and we were all staying the night. It was just the four of us high schoolers there at night. That same night, there was a severe weather warning due to a storm that had the potential to create tornadoes, which it did closer to the Connecticut River Valley and parts of Massachusetts. I think there were somewhere around three small tornadoes that night, pretty wild for New England slash New York. The wind even without the tornadoes was intense, and we were just glad that this house had a good sized yard with no tall trees to fall. It was pouring rain, there was lightning, and the classic backdrop to your spooky story. We're all set up on the second story of the top floor. One of our friends was asleep and somehow managed to sleep through this entire ordeal. The rest of us were all awake, talking about how we weren't in danger of tornadoes. 
except one of us, was convinced that we were all going to die that night. Mid-conversation, there's a loud bang, and the entire house rattles. Is that even supposed to happen? What could it be? We come up with some theories. Is there a tree down? No trees, earthquake? No reports online, maybe wind? No trees downed outside? We're down to the bulkhead just slammed the door shut, and we grab a few knives and head downstairs. In the living room, we all notice for the first time how many porcelain dolls Nick's mother owns. We check every room to find nothing but those creepy dolls, but nothing that could cause a bang. There are two rooms left, the basement and the closet, that is barely enough to hold folded linens. We decide if the bulkhead isn't locked, then we forgot to close it, and there'll be water in the basement, and the sound we heard was the wind knocking it shut. If the bulkhead is locked, we remembered to close it. The bulkhead was locked shut, and the floor was bone dry. The sound wasn't the bulkhead. There's one room left, and it's the closet. What could be in the closet? It's only big enough to hold Houdini himself. We open it up, and instantly something falls and we hear the sound of glass shatter. Looking at the ground, it's one of the dolls. What was it doing in the closet? Why would it be propped up that easily to let it fall? We couldn't care. We just went upstairs and did our best to fall asleep. It's something that we all try not to think about, but every once in a while we hear a murmur or a grunt, and we'll never know what it was or where it was coming from. We also don't know whatever happened to that broken doll. My Encounter with the Fae This story is one of my first memories. It takes place either shortly before or shortly after my third birthday. That will be the last week in June 1980. My mum and I went to West Virginia to celebrate my birthday with her side of the family. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland at the time, so it wasn't too long of a trip. My mum's family lives in the small town of Shady Springs in Raleigh country. Shady Springs is nestled in the lush forest of the Irish mountain. One day, my cousin Leonard, who at the time was known as Eugene, decided that he would take me into the woods. I remember he had a rifle on his back, so I'm assuming he was hunting something. Raccoon or squirrel. Now, why my mum or the rest of the family allowed Leonard to take a three-year-old into the woods is beyond my comprehension, but I guess it's a different era. So Leonard took me into the woods, and we walked around for a while. I remembered being in awe of how massive it all seemed. Then again, everything seems larger to a three-year-old. I don't know how long we walked for, since children have a scrawny sense of time, but apparently... I became tired, or became a nuisance. My cousin Leonard decided to leave me sitting on a log while he continued wandering the woods. Really? You're gonna leave a three-year-old alone in the woods when there are bears and snakes? Leonard, before this, used to torment me with stories about bears, which could explain my little fear about bears. So, Leonard left me alone in the woods. While I sat there for what felt like hours, I was starting to become afraid of the animal noises that were coming from deeper in the woods, and that just seemed to be getting closer. I had no idea how to get back to my grandparents' house, and I was just about to start crying when I looked over at a tree that was about 30 feet away. At the foot of the tree were some little men. I'm not talking dwarfs, more like the size of a squirrel. These men were sitting around the base of a tree and smoking pipes. They wore red hats, and had beards. They were looking right at me. They must have realized I was frightened over the whole experience. They smiled, and all pointed in one direction. I don't know why, but I decided to follow the direction they were pointing. It felt as if I were walking a very long time, but eventually I returned to my grandparents' house. I started yelling for my mum. She came outside, and was shocked to see that I had come home without my cousin. She asked where he was, and I told her that he had left me alone in the woods. Needless to say, 
He heard about that from my mum, my grandparents and his mother. It wasn't until years later that I told her about the little men who had pointed my way out of the woods. It wasn't until much later, when researching fairies, that I discovered that I was helped by gnomes, or some similar species to the gnome family. My memories of this incident fade in and out. I grew up in Germany, and it must have been 92 or 3. Once a year my class would go on a school trip, and it was during my second or third year. So I must have been about 8 or 9. Enrollment is from age 6 in Germany, but I enrolled at age 7. Our next trip was somewhere in Lower Saxony. I can't remember where. Each room had four bunk beds by the doors, and a recreational area at the end of the room. It had large windows and a glass door to open it. Well, as kids do, we joked around and stayed up longer than permitted. It was actually so dark outside that it scared us, so we kept the curtain shut. A classmate of mine played a daring game, hiding behind the curtains and tearing them open. Dennis decided to run outside and frighten the others next door, which he did. The next thing I remember is Dennis back in our room, and we saw something moving outside. We start to panic and told our teacher. She told us to calm down, closed the curtains and left. Dennis was curious and found it extremely funny to run outside again. The next thing I remember is me standing outside because I was worried about him. Some guy picked him up and vanished into the darkness. I couldn't see a thing, so I called his name and a few moments later he appeared before me laughing. He told me to try out this fun game, to be carried by this guy. Next memory, Dennis panicked and I was in the arms of this man. He ran away with me, and the hostile lights started to seem more distant. I struggled for him to let me go, because he was pressing my chest so tightly. He told me that it was fun and that I shouldn't worry. As I continued to fight and yelled for help, he then panicked and strangled me until I lost my breath. For some reason I was able to grab his hand and pull it away from my neck. Why are you so strong, he said, and I'll never forget those words. The next memory I have is of being free, kicking him in the leg and running away. I returned and other things happened. My maths teacher caught that guy and another teacher spoke to me about something. I'm absolutely certain that they told the guy to leave. The next morning the police arrived with this boy, who was in his teens or early twenties, to apologise to me because he had caused some trouble in the area the night before. I still remember his eyes widen as he saw me. My teachers called me a liar for some reason, and that I shouldn't tell my parents. That's all I remember. I always believed it was a figment of my imagination. The funny thing is, I can't have anything tight around my neck. For example, ties stress me out. When I get anxiety attacks, my chest and throat tighten only. I guess it's some form of confirmation to me that those memories are true. One of my friends always has these get rich quick schemes or shady ways of making money on the side. In one of his more brilliant moves, he decides he's going to rent a house out near the country line to host illegal poker games. Anyway, this property is probably four or five acres with a tiny rundown church about a thousand yards away on one side, and a redneck guy living in a trailer probably a quarter of a mile or so on the other side. However, the property backs up to the woods, and since it's always cheaper than the range, I and a third friend ask our renter friend if we can go shoot some guns on the property. He obliges us and we head out there on a Saturday afternoon and find a nice barn at the tree line to go shoot into. 
now we're just shooting paper targets with pistols. So we're not that far back, and don't need that much room to do it. After a few magazines, we decide to venture into the woods to see how far back the property goes. We get down to the bottom of the hill, and see the fluorescent ribbons that the surveyors tied to the trees to mark the property line. We realise the property is bigger than we thought, because we're about 150 to 200 yards in the woods at this point. Just as we're remarking about how big it is, we see a dead animal about 10 yards away across the property line. Walking up to examine it, we see it's a goat that's had its head cut off. Like, cleanly done by a human cut off. Then we see a severed goat head a little further away. The creepy part is, it's not the same goat. The fur is different, and cut differently. Imagine one head cut off a chin, and then another cut off at the shoulders. Well, we didn't stick around to see if there was a goat neck anywhere, because we realised that it wasn't decayed very much, and must have been done in the last day or two. Now, if we weren't armed, it would have been a lot scarier, but it was still creepy because I fear humans more than anything you can get out in the woods. Now, I say this was out there in the country, but it was in South Carolina. So there's not really a crazy expanse of wilderness being an East Coast state. That's pretty much all settled by people. The thing that gets me is that there was a serial killer they caught there not too long ago. This incident happened 10 years back. So perhaps he was killing animals first. I am of Mexican descent, and in our culture, the dead and spirit are a big part of it, as you know by Dia de los Muertos. Now, as a kid, my family would always share ghost stories from the old country in Mexico. I would like to share a few, if you're interested. This one is from my grandma. She states that when she was a little girl, she saw the devil himself. Back then, circa 1940s, many families were poor, and I mean very poor. She lived in a poor village in Guerrero, and to go to the bathroom, you needed to take a nice trip into the forest, even at night, in pitch darkness, with only the stars and moon to guide you. She was peering, and when she walked back home, she heard what sounded like a parade of horses coming her way. Of course, that would not be possible, as it was pitch black. And no one travelled the roads at that time. That's when she saw a figure, mounted on one horse, and not many like she'd heard, and he did not look up. Just told her something and kept going, and then shortly disappeared. When she arrived home, her mother saw all her hairs standing on end. This, in her village, meant only one thing. Contact with an evil presence. Another story she encountered was the famous weeping woman, La Llorona, in a similar situation while out in the woods at night. She said a woman, half white and half shadow, was walking down a dirt road while crying and giving out loud laments. You could not see her face, and she didn't seem to have any legs as she floated down the road. This story is from my parents. In Mexico and in other places in Latin America, there are many accounts of duendes, or gnomes, and evil-natured spirits such as Nahuales, shapeshifters, which I suppose are similar to skinwalkers, and chaneques, forest imps, as well as hadas, fairies. My mother told me this story of her sister, who had a baby daughter. One night, my aunt was sleeping. They lived in a village where the forests are your backyard, and she said she saw a little child walk around and making noise. She had a young son, but he was sleeping in his room. The girl was newborn and could not walk yet, so she had no idea who this child was. She called the child thinking it was her son, and it ran towards her room and darted under her bed. 
when she looked down getting ready to scold the child, as she thought it was her son playing into the late hours of the night. There's nothing there. In Mexico, it is believed that gnomes can take the souls of children, effectively ending their lives. This almost happened to my father. He was at his grandmother's house playing in the yard, and she had many trees. Bear in mind, this is when he was a kid, when suddenly he saw a bunch of naked children on the top of a tree calling his name and gesturing him to climb up. He asked his grandma if he could play with the kids, but of course she saw nothing up there and held him inside because she knew what it was. She said some prayer, completely freaking out my dad, and said that he was not allowed to play there again. In another instance though, unfortunately, he was playing with his baby cousin, sitting in a baby chair, when suddenly his cousin just dropped her head like she had fallen asleep. But she hadn't fallen asleep. She had passed away. My dad called over his aunt, and when examining her, they found marks on her neck as if she had been strangled by an unseen force. My mother said that her father and neighbour were enemies, but there was something about this neighbour that scared the locals. There were many rumours and claims that he was a Nawa. This is because, when that home was sold, they found, hidden within, a book of spells, witchcraft and Satanism, and had Nawal related entries. The final story involves a ghost from the Mexican Revolution. My mother was a young girl. This is basically a repeat of my grandmother's story. She went out to use the bathroom in the late hours of the night, when she looked up and saw a man dressed in revolutionary clothing sitting upon a rock. No one was out at those times, and he had an old Mexican Revolution type sombrero and just looked into my mother's direction, but he had no face. He was just a silhouette. She got up as fast as she could and ran back inside. It is said in her village that a Mexican revolutionary guerrilla soldier was executed in that spot, hung from a tree, and it was common in the times as most revolutionaries were either hung or had a firing squad shoot them as their execution. So as a kid, I loved to burn spiders. It's something that now I think of, and it sounds horrifying, but at that age I didn't even care. So as soon as I found a spider, I let my mother know, and she would burn it with an enormous lighter. I don't really know how many times, or how many spiders we incinerated, but my bet is that it's an enormous amount. It's worth noting that when you burn a spider, it gets stiff, and the legs get rolled in, and at the end, you get a sphere-shaped spider, and if you pay close attention, you will hear the crunching of the poor little thing. This was the main procedure whenever I found a spider and it was fun for me and my brothers, except for the one spider, the last one we burnt. I remember that I was playing with my brother. We were running all over the house, and we suddenly saw a spider. It was the most ugly thing in the world. Thin legs, yellow, with black and green stripes all over it. It was the biggest spider I have ever seen so far. Not that big to be a tarantula though, so we run back to the kitchen where my mother was. We told her that we had found a spider. At this point, she knew what to do already, so we didn't have to tell her. She picks the lighter and goes with us. The spider was standing on the corner of a room. My mum uses the lighter, and as soon as the flame touches the spider, we hear this extremely loud scream all over the room, and only inside that room. It was like a baby screaming. Remember that I told you it was worth noting what happens to spiders when they get burnt? Well, this spider was different. It literally turned into dust, black and extremely thin, and there was no trace of the spider. I mean, not even a half burnt leg, it just completely turned to dust. From that day on, 
If I happened to find a spider, let's say that I'm at my friend's house, I kind of feel something in the corner. And guess what? There'd be a spider there. There's also a lot of spider activity in my bathroom. My father finishes his shower, and he actually checks to see if there are any insects before. And after the experience, I can't stand spiders, and I get paralyzed whenever I see one. And after he would check, he'd go out of the bathroom and when I would get in, I'd remove the curtain, and there would be a spider in the middle of the tub, as if it were waiting for me. Here in Mexico, there are legends of Nahuales, which are humans that can turn into animals and insects, and that there are some people who believe that I may have burnt one. Since it was like a baby screaming, people say it might also be a baby that was turned into a spider by a witch. What do you think? As for my fear of spiders, I can't do much. I have also seen some experts, and they do not believe the story. So their therapies don't seem to work, which I understand. And I also accept the spider sighting like a punishment for having been so aggressive with them in the past. The spider thing only happens with me, not my brother or my mother. I think it was because I was the one who enjoyed it the most, but I will never know. I've barely spoken about this since it happened two years ago. I was 16 and on an excursion to a small town in Zambia for two weeks. I'm from Ireland, and I was with nine other students. The two weeks entailed painting a primary school, showing disabled kids how to work, and meeting locals and visiting their villages. It was great and unforgettable, and something I'll treasure for the rest of my life. One of the days, we visited a coffee farm. It was located in a beautiful location, up upon high hills. We were getting a tour and exploring, when the owner of the coffee farm, a European man, comes to meet us. I'm purposely being vague in order to conceal his identity. He invites us back into his house. We all get into our cars and drive. I can't describe it to you. His lane we drove took about 30 minutes. It was surrounded by water and was beautiful. It looked like paradise. When we reached his house, right away it was weird. He kept all the dark-skinned people outside. The ones who worked for him and our driver, who should have been considered guests. All but one maid he joked about being his second wife. Laughing and wrapping his arm around her when she looked more than uncomfortable. And he gave us a quick tour of his mansion before he brought us into his living room. I remember it vividly. I sat on the couch directly opposite the fireplace. My girlfriend was on this trip too, and she was sitting next to me. He told her to move, and he came and sat next to me. He started sharing stories about his life here in Zambia, and boosting about his wealth and whatnot. Every time he spoke, he would gesticulate, and his hand would brush against my breast. The first time I thought it was a mistake, but a few minutes passed, and it kept happening, and his hand would graze my thigh. His maid brought in tea, and he asked who the youngest on the trip was. It was me. He instructed me to pour tea out for everyone. I had to get on my knees and pour tea out, and I did it. And once that was done, he continued until we left. I think everyone noticed it, but no one said or acknowledged it, and that he was humiliating me. He was touching me and getting away with it, in front of my girlfriend, peers, and teachers. My girlfriend kept mouthing for me to move away, but I didn't want to bring further attention to it. I felt frozen in place, I suppose. So that was it. We drove back, and I felt disgusting and ashamed, knowing that everyone saw it. Writing this, I looked him up out of curiosity, and seeing his face, made me more anxious than I thought it would. I haven't really let myself think about it until now. Luckily, I'll never have to meet him again. I am 16, 
This happened the 8th of July, 2016. I live in Massachusetts, which is where this happened. The day started normally. I went to school, had a test in vet tech, as I go to a technical high school, and one of its classes is vet tech, and I took the bus home. Both of my parents were at work like normal, but after three hours when my mum should have been home, I got worried. About 5 p.m. I got a call from my dad, who told me my mum was in a car accident, and that they are both in the hospital, and would be there for a while. It got very late, almost 10, and my parents weren't home, so I decided to put my younger brothers to bed. I stayed up, waiting for my parents to get home, and I spent my time reading and writing an essay for school until around 1am. I got a call from my dad who said he wasn't coming home. He was staying in a motel that was closer to the hospital. I got off the phone and finished the part of the essay I was on. I gathered my stuff and walked through the kitchen, heading towards the stairs that led upstairs, when a moaning sound reached my ears. The moaning came from outside, it was really loud, and stopped occasionally, like whatever was making the sound voice was cracking. It sounded pained. I turned on the outside light to see an ugly sight. Sitting in the yard just a few feet from the house was a coyote. It was horribly injured. His head was partially caved in on the left side, its paw was bleeding, and this was evident by the pool of blood with the paw in the direct middle. It appeared that it had a long deep gash all the way down its back, and all of the wounds were bleeding. I reached for my pocket, trying to get my phone, only to realise I had left it on the table I'd been working on. I turned and rushed back to the table. I was planning to call a local vet clinic that I knew was open 24-7. When I reached the table, the moaning got much, much louder and more pained. Then it stopped. I grabbed my phone and ran back to the window. At first, I was confused. The coyote was gone, replaced by a common tabby cat. It was odd. The cat was sitting directly in the same place the coyote had been. After the initial shock, I noticed that the tabby cat had the same injuries. Same bleeding paw, same caved in head, and the same gnashes down its back. Something was different, however. I couldn't pinpoint the difference for a good three minutes. Then I realised that the right shoulder blade was kind of pointing out at a completely unnatural angle. It looked deformed and painful, and I dropped my phone as soon as I noticed this. When my phone hit the floor, the cat began meowing loudly. I stared at it, as it meowed and stared right back at me. It was looking directly at me, and blinking. After a good while, I slowly picked up my phone off the floor. I straightened back up, and looked out the window, and the cat was gone. I had only looked away for a few seconds, and in that short time, the horribly injured cat had vanished. Some unknown feeling made me go outside to look for the cat. I don't know what it was. Worry? Perhaps curiosity. Hell, it might have been something the animal made me feel. I have no clue. Now outside, I first walked to the puddle of blood and looked for a trail of it. I found it and started to follow the trail and found that it ended as soon as it passed the gate. To make sure that I could see it in the dark, I pulled out my phone and illuminated the ground around me. I looked around for five minutes, but didn't see anything. Just like the cat, the trail had also vanished. I called the veterinary clinic, and they sent out a car, and they looked around, but the trail was gone, and they couldn't find it. At the time, I didn't think of this until afterwards but I realised that there was no trail of blood leading to my house. I have no idea what the hell this thing was. None of my searches have turned up any results close to what I saw. I am completely convinced that the coyote and the cat were the same creature, and that it is 
neither a coyote nor a cat. Afterwards, I asked around, and there were no records of dead cats or coyotes turning up with injuries. The creature couldn't get far with those wounds that it had. Does anyone have any ideas of what I saw? When I was six, I was out back in my grandfather's house in the woods, and I had a small dog named Nova. Well, I was an outdoor child and hated playing inside, so I took my dog and went for walks in the woods. My grandfather has a shed right at the tree line. This time I decided to play to the right of the shed, maybe 10 feet away. My dog started growling over, and there was a hole underneath it. So I assumed a groundhog lived there. I ignored him and continued playing. Then I heard a shuffling sound and looked over, and I swear to God I saw two short little dudes with little pointy hats on. I don't remember the colour of their clothes, but they were bright and very noticeable against the light blue shed. They stared at me and stopped moving when I saw them. Then I grabbed Nova and ran back to the house and never saw them again. But ever since I've had a ridiculous irrational fear of gnomes. It's so bad that I wouldn't go into my friend's house one time when I picked him up. I literally waited outside the car because I saw his mum had gnomes out front. It sounds silly, but I am now scared to death of them. I've got a good through hiking crew. We've done pieces of the Appalachian Trail, some Florida swamp, and a good amount in Maine. We consider ourselves pretty experienced. Two of us are military. The other two are just fun to have around. So with that said, we emphasize preparation. This was probably 2015. We planned a 10 day trip in West Virginia, along a river the weeks after Christmas. This is our favorite time to camp. Because one, we're all home. Two, bugs aren't around. And three, no one else is stupid enough to camp at that time of year. We've done the trail before and felt comfortable with the forecast. Highs in the low 30s, lows in the teens, nothing we couldn't handle. We set off. Weather is great. The trail we're on is a 26 mile loop, hand railing a river most of the way. We eventually get to the spot we mapped out on the second day, about 14 miles in, and get ready to chill and do man stuff for the week. We rock out of the woods doing the usual for us. Cutting wood, hopping into the river, hunting, fishing, writing and the like. Now we've been out there before, and have explored perhaps a 3x3 three three square grid radius, and we didn't hear or sense the presence of anyone else near there. Things start to get gnarly. I'll get into the paranormal first though. It's 5am. And we start getting into our morning routine. One of the guys heads the 10 meters down the river to catch breakfast. One starts checking on the NOAA forecast on the radio. And one starts to unfreeze our water filter. And I'm pulling out the morning firewood. I'm restarting our fire as it gets brighter. I notice there's this gorgeous pair of black labs rummaging around the outskirts of our camp. Pleasantly surprised, we are all pumped to find some pups. Because we're idiots, and none of us care where they came from. Within seconds, this raggedy looking West Virginia guy appears out of nowhere by a tree. Shotgun over the shoulder, sweet jean jacket on, and a cowboy hat. The good West Virginian look that I respect. He says morning, and that we have a nice fire. The way he said it was chilling. We all felt like we could see right through him. We asked him how he got there. Mind you, the sun is barely peeking through the woods, and we're 14 miles in nowhere forest. And we haven't seen a trace of anyone in five days. The man says nothing, looks at us and turns to walk out into the dawn, with the dogs following. 
We're standing there dumbfounded, and when we find our pulse immediately start looking from where he came from, and which direction he was heading. Obviously we found nothing. No tracks, not even the dogs. But now, to the survival part. We had snow in the forecast for most of the week, which we had almost every day. Not too much, maybe only 4 inches through the week, but we noticed it had started to get warmer. We're laying down for the night checking our nightly forecast and they're talking about the snow coming in for the night. No worries in our mind, at least it's not rain. False. We had limited cloud cover the day before and the air was still pretty warm that night. The snow turned into rain. We hadn't taken rain precautions before we bedded down since we were just expecting snow. We wake up around 3am, packs and boots dripping. We get up to start getting an emergency plan together. The temperature is dropping, and we're wet. Precip turns to ice, with a whole day of precip ahead of us. We end up packing everything up, try to sanitize our area, but one of the guys starts going down. He's really lean, so he's pretty susceptible to cold weather injuries. We get all our dry clothing off us, and get him into them. We propped up a makeshift shelter of boughs and tarps, and an emergency blanket for him while we finished getting ready to step off. We rucked the 14 miles back to our car that morning, and drove the 4 hours back. Lesson learned, it always rains. Let me start off by saying that this is not my story, but it was such a crazy encounter that I have since asked each of my friends throughout the years to recount the events. This happened around the year 2000. About a year after this took place, I started dating one of these friends, and that's when I first heard about this dog slash wolf story. I have since asked each friend over the years and miles apart, and they all remember the encounter the very same way. Before my ex was even my boyfriend, he and our other friends were all about 17 to 18 years old. At that age, I remember it being an adventure to find a place to smoke. Let's hike to this place and puff. Ah, the good old days. The four of them decided to drive to Mount Pisgah a beautiful wooded area outside of Eugene, Oregon. It's more of a hill, but it's nature in its prime form for sure. I've been out there many times growing up, and I know exactly what trail they were on. It was Jay, my ex-boyfriend, and his best friend, Barry, and their girlfriends, Sarah and Mary. They had driven in Barry's little white sedan, parked in the parking lot, and hiked the trail to the river where they smoked some bowls. The group spent the day out there swimming, puffing, puffing and swimming, just being typical teenagers. I can imagine the hunger is what drove them to go home after a few hours, as the sun began to set. Either activity alone is bound to get someone hungry, let alone both. So they walked along the well-worn main dirt path to the parking lot. This has since been paved, and it doesn't take not 20 minutes for them to get back to the little footbridge by the parking lot that they had crossed when they hiked in. When they reached this small footbridge near the parking lot, Barry looked out into the vast fields between them and the wooded area, and noticed a huge dog. The dog was just sitting there, not looking scary, just looking like a humongous friendly dog about 70 yards away. It was starting to get dark, but from Mary's description, and the drawing she did later for me in 2005, it was very shaggy and furry. My friends continued to walk across this small wooden bridge, and one of the girls screamed. The big dog was now on its hind legs, standing much closer than when they had seen it a few seconds earlier. It had traversed most of the large field in the seconds it took them to get past the 10 foot long bridge. Whatever this thing was, it was fast, quiet, and stealthy. My four friends ran to the car, and they had the classic cliche, 
I can't get the key in, because Barry was fumbling madly for the keys. At this point, the dog was just standing at the very edge of the parking lot, looking at them. As my ex Jay had said, every time they looked up, he would be closer, but not moving. All of them recounted how surreal it was to see a dog standing on its hind legs. I don't know if it ran for a few ticks and then stood up again at intervals in the field, but that's the way they describe it. Many times I asked them, are you sure it wasn't a bear? Nope, it was definitely a dog standing on its hind legs, a big dog that was stalking them. This is in the Lane County, Oregon in the year 2000. There are few, if any, bears out there. It would be odd, but then again, I wasn't there. The kids got in the car, sped off, leaving the pigs a dog to do its own business. I've never had any reason to doubt any of their stories. In fact, Sarah doesn't like to talk about the incident because it's just too creepy for her to recall. This story happened in the late 90s. I was around 11 or so. At the time, I was a member of the Boy Slash Girl Scouts. In Germany, Boy and Girl Scouts are not separated from each other, so I spent a lot of my childhood in the forest. We camped in the local woods quite a lot, and often told each other other creepy stories right before bedtime. Of course, we always claimed our stories to be true and such. And from an early age, you'll believe nearly everything. These stories evolved over the years. And one of them, which started with a simple, there's a creepy homeless man living in the woods, became worse and worse, and ended up being something like, there's a creepy homeless man living in the woods. He catches children and eats them. One of them even claimed he knew exactly where this guy lived, and after a small argument, we decided to look for ourselves. So we waited until the adults were asleep and slipped out of our tent. We knew we were not allowed to, and this increased our excitement even more. The best part of it, girls like to hold hands, and when they're scared in a pitch black forest with only two flashlights and no one else around, it just took about a minute until the first one grabbed my arm. We walked through the woods for at least 40 minutes and then saw it. A big blue tent covered in leaves with wood piles around it. It looked old and rotten and we saw bottles and trash lying around. Every single one of us was scared to death. One of the girls started crying and most of us just wanted to go back. But a few boys said that there's no one living in there, and to prove it, they grabbed sticks and rocks and threw them at the tent. At first, nothing happened. But then, we heard swearing, and the whole tent was moving. Suddenly, a man jumped out. I can remember him quite clearly. Many layers of clothing and long hair. He was furious, yelling, swearing, and all excitement was gone, and we ran as fast as we could. The girls and most of the boys were crying when we finally reached our camp, but we decided to not tell anyone. Back in our tent, we tried to sleep, but none of us could. Some girls were still crying, and we were all scared that the man followed us. It took us nearly the whole night to calm down, but at this point, the night was still quite nice for me. The girl who grabbed my arm earlier came over and crawled into my sleeping bag with me. She was shaking and scared, but I never felt so cozy and comfortable before. It took me nearly seven years to get another girl this close to me. A few weeks later, my parents talked about the newspaper, and this gave me the chills. The local police arrested a man who lived in the woods for two years. He had escaped prison. He broke into nearby houses to get food and money, and this is how he got caught in the end. We never spoke to our parents about it, and they never caught whiff of what we did. So creepy hobo in the woods, maybe you never ate kids, but let's not meet again. Yeah. Yeah. 
I grew up in an old house in the south, kind of in the middle of nowhere. The house was laid out somewhat circular, as you could walk from the living room through most other rooms just by walking in a complete circle, and end up back where you started. When I was around five, me and my younger sister were chasing each other in circles, while my mum cooked dinner. I was in front of her, and we were laughing and carrying on. When we got into the dining room, in the inside corner, there was a small greenish creature with a dark cloak on. It had pointy ears that stuck out and sharp teeth. I was young, but it was still very small, so perhaps two feet. It looked kind of like it had been at the bottom of a pond, very old and tattered. It put its finger up to its lips and was grinning. I slammed to a stop and my sister was chasing so close that she ran right into me, which pushed us both into the corner, into the kitchen. We both started screaming, and my mum ran to us to see what was the matter, but the thing had gone. This has haunted me for years. I'm 25 now, and although I've done tons of research, I've never found anything that really fits what we saw. For a long time, I thought maybe I'd imagined it, if it weren't for my sister also seeing it, or my mum remembering our very real terror, I probably would have just written it off. Are there any ideas that you guys have of what this could be? There were lots of weird things happening in the house when I was young. Disembodied voices, things moving, very strange dreams. But that was obviously the weirdest and most unsettling. We still kind of talk about it from time to time, and it always makes us feel kind of yucky. I'm a former counsellor and camper at a camp in the northeastern United States. I would like to start off my story by stating that these things are not only my accounts of things, but other campers and counsellors. So I'll begin with some history. The camp started in the 30s, but the land is much older, back to pre-colonization, aka Indian land, from what I've heard. There was at least two battles fought on the land, one with Indian wars and the other Indian versus colonists. Now, We'll go into some stuff I have personally experienced, and I can say that my word is true, but you can't always trust the people on the internet. Anyway, the first few experiences are minor, the occasional shadow on overnights, but as I've been there longer, I've noticed more. The main thing that me and the other counsellors and even campers have mentioned is drumming late at night. Probably the scariest thing to happen to me is the other counsellors and campers went to make a final bathroom stop and get their teeth brushed. I got elected to stay back and make sure no coyotes or raccoons were trying to take the few uneaten hot dogs sitting out. I was alone. I was casually sitting on the bench when I heard what I can only describe as a rushing presence, like something was rushing around me. And I heard leaves crinkling in patterns that no animal could make. Some of the other counsellors have had stuff happen in the log cabin or mess hall. One of the campers cut himself, and a counsellor, Jack, was giving first aid, and was casually making conversation to stop him worrying about the blood and he just mentions a man in a plaid shirt in the back of the room. Jack sees this, and tells him there's nobody there, and the camper replies, Yeah, I know you can't see him. He doesn't want you to see him. Jack quit later that week. One of the older staff has a logbook of things people have seen, and, sadly, he quit and took the book before I could read it, but a picture left at his station had the camp's fire circle with a red orb above it, 
but almost everyone who has worked there has had one experience or another. I can confirm it is indeed Indian land, because people, including me, have found arrowheads on the ground. But other than that, it's just mainly rumours that circulated, like a hunter haunting one of the cabins with his dog. And apparently, someone in the 30s got into the lake on a foggy night and drowned. Not sure if that one's true though. Either way, it is a very creepy place. I dated a guy in high school whose family was from Norway. When he was 10, his family all went back to Norway in the summertime to stay at his mother's parents' farm. It was a working farm that was also attached to a large forest. David was told that he could go anywhere on the farm that he wanted, and into the forest, up some agreed upon boundary no further line. Of course, being 10, he disobeyed, and went further into the forest. He was walking along, having found a path, when he started hearing someone yelling in Norwegian. He came around a bend, and found what he described as a gnome. The gnome was about the height of a four-year-old. He was adult, had a full beard, and his clothes looked handmade. He had the typical gnome-type hat. I'm pretty sure he said it was red, but I could be wrong. I do know that his suit was in light browns or greens, pretty much forest colours. The gnome was screaming at David in Norwegian, shaking his fists. David spoke Norwegian at home, but this form of Norwegian he couldn't really understand, although to him it sounded familiar enough for him to think that it was Norwegian. The thing that really had him flawed was that the gnome was buried up to his knees in the hard dirt path. He wasn't trying to pull himself out, so David did not think that he was stuck. It seemed to him that that was a normal thing for the gnome. David fled the scene, and made it back safely to his grandpa's farm. When he got there, he sat down on a bench along the wall to catch his breath. His mum saw him running, and came and sat beside him. She said to him, You went too far into the woods, didn't you? He could only nod his head. At the time, he told me this. His mother had never said another word to him about it and he never asked her about it either. It drove me crazy, and I bugged him to ask her more and more, but he never did. I've tried to find him online, as he has a very odd last name, but I never have. If I do, I'd like to ask him more questions about his mother and the gnomes in the forest by their farm. While I was growing up, my family would visit the same lake every year for a week every summer. As we got older, we would visit a large rock called the cliffs and jump off. The rock was only 15 feet tall at the highest point, but the water was really deep. When we got older, we would jump in and try to touch the bottom, but we never could. When my brother and I were in our teens, we took kayaks out to the cliffs to jump on our own. We jumped off several times, and when we got too cold, we took a break on the top of the cliffs to warm up in the sun. As we were sitting there, we noticed a white shape in the water, floating towards the surface. It was a letter, H. Eventually, it sank back into the water, and we lost sight of it. Before we could look away or say anything, another shape floats up. It was the letter E. Eventually, it too sank below, but it was soon followed by two more letters, L and P. We didn't jump in after that. We stood up and left without saying a word. We never mentioned it to anyone, and I forgot it had even happened for a while. Several years ago, I was working at a camp counsellor, and I told this story as a ghost story. I'd forgotten about it, and I texted my brother to see if I hadn't just made it up completely. I asked him if he remembered the time we went jumping off cliffs alone, and saw something in the water. He replied yes, that he remembered. 
I asked him what it was, and his reply was, the letters spelled help. It was back in about fourth grade. I couldn't have been older than eight or nine. I lived in the country near a small Minnesotan town called Iyota, and it was pretty out there in the middle of nowhere. At about 6.50 in the morning, I got on the bus, like I would any other day to head to school. I had an hour long morning ride, and an hour long evening ride. About three quarters of the way there, we went down a side street. A kid named Jacob lived there, and there were about three houses in total down the street. In between the houses were open fields. As Jacob was picked up, I looked on the opposing side of the road, and saw three figures like I had never seen before next to a white house. They were black, long, lanky. They looked almost like panthers, but distorted in some way. They were much bigger than panthers, and their faces were almost pointed at the bottom. They looked almost reptilian. It was difficult to see details in the morning fog. They crawled on all fours, and one of them looked to be a bit smaller than the other two. One of the big ones walked ahead a little bit, and waited for the other two to catch up. They disappeared behind the house, and I scrambled for my little blackberry hoping to catch a picture but as we moved away from the house, there was no sight of them. I thought about what I had just seen, and didn't particularly know what to think. I told my friend Erica about it, and she didn't flat out tell me she thought I was lying, but I could feel it. The house is now gone. It must have been demolished, and it was fairly old and looked to be in fairly bad shape when the incident occurred. Though, I am not, and have never really been religious. I did have a fair amount of strange occurrences happen in my childhood, this being one of the biggest. For the past seven years or so, I have pushed it to the back of my mind, but every now and then it will come up. As I was listening to a podcast mentioning skinwalkers, I thought of this experience, and thought I would share it with you guys, for help. If anybody has any clues as to what this could be, please. Do let me know. I was around seven or eight, and every morning when I would wake, I would go into my grandma's room and lay in bed with her until she awoke. One morning, I go in and get the blankets and lay down with her. I look over and next to the dresser in front of the closet are two six to eight inch little men. I just stared at them frozen because I was terrified. I finally closed my eyes and hoped they would go away. I opened them up and they were gone. I've always wondered if what I saw was real, but I can picture it so vividly, like I can even remember what they were wearing. One had a red shirt and the other had an orange shirt. I'm 30 now. And to this day, I am profoundly terrified of garden gnomes, like panicky, sweaty, and racing heart kind of scared. Any idea what they could have been, or if I have a good reason to be afraid of them. In my graduation year of high school, the class went to a trip to a beach town. I was always a loner in school, and the only friends I had in school didn't go to this trip. I never really interacted much with my classmates. At this point in the trip, we are about 21 people, and we're left in a famous seaside street filled with bars and restaurants. We were allowed to be free and have fun and eat and drink whatever we wanted. It was night time, and we could do as we pleased in that street until midnight. This is not the US by the way, and I'm not even sure if this is allowed in the US. My classmates started grouping up and choosing places to eat and drink, and despair took over me, as I hated grouping up. As always I was alone, and decided to wander around to find a place to have dinner alone. Looking at the restaurants, I found a really cute one that served artisanal pasta, and it was empty. 
an old man was almost begging for people to come and take a look. I was such a good guy before this trip that I couldn't say no to eating there and to make the old guy and the owner happy. As I ate my tagliatelle with octopus, which is the worst dish I've ever had, a hobo sat at the floor by me and started chatting. I was such a good guy that I thought, oh poor hobo, I don't need to pretend that he's invisible, he's a person just like me, and I chatted back. He asked if the food was good, and when the owner saw the hobo, they came right away yelling at him to leave, and I was like, now it's fine, we're chatting, and they gave up. The hobo said he was hungry, and if I could buy him food. I said yes. He told me he had a restaurant that he really liked, and he would like food from there. I offered him money, and he denied it, and said he couldn't buy the food himself because the people there don't like him. I was such a nice guy, that I said sure, let me finish here and I'll go buy it for you. He waited patiently, and when I was done he guided me there. We passed by the most populous part of the street, where some of the others were, and a classmate, that I should allow myself to call a friend now, asked where I was going with the hobo. I said I was going to buy him food, and that it was okay. She didn't appear to accept it, but I proceeded following the hobo. It was getting further away, the street was becoming darker, and with less restaurants. I told the hobo, are you sure it's around here? There doesn't appear to be any restaurants anymore. He assured me it was just round the corner. Just as we exchanged these words, I heard someone screaming my name in the distance. It was that friend. Michael, what are you doing there? Come back here right away. She appeared really distressed. Still clueless, I thought she also needed my help, or had something to tell me. I told the hobo that my friend was calling, and that I needed to go over there. But we're almost arriving. I have to go and I ran to her. Are you crazy? What, are you out of your mind? I've been asking around and that hobo is a super dangerous criminal around here. Come right back with me. And I was saved by that friend from what could have been a horrible end to me or worse. From that day, I learned a valuable lesson. Be an ass. I'm not a good guy for everyone anymore. I pretend hobos don't exist, and I don't help random people around. From that day, I learnt a valuable lesson. Basically, don't be naive, and don't be so nice to people. For context, this is Australia. I was travelling to this campsite about 20 minutes past a small town, and had gotten there about an hour-ish after dark. Now I was the only person there, and when I called the off-site caretaker to book, he said that since it was just me, that I could use the day shelter slash kitchen. So instead of setting up my tent in the dark, I decided to drag my sleeping bag inside where I had some actual light. Hours later, I realised I require something from my car, so I drag open the sliding door, and this wasn't a small door, it was one of those big loud ones like you would see on a barn. I was looking out into the darkness, as there were no lights or moon, just the glow from the lights behind me. Now in case you've never been in a situation like this, when the light reaches about 10 metres, there has to be about one metre where it drops off into nothingness. And in this small patch I saw four legs. These were not just normal legs. They were those of a dog, and long like human legs. They were bright white, and stretched up to where they could connect to the body of the animal. But there was nothing there. Then it began to move. The legs walked. They walked in parallel to the building, making sure that they remained in the grey corridor, then disappeared into the darkness. I decided that I didn't really need to get whatever it was from my car, and slept barricaded in the tiny office. To this day, I don't know what they were, and I have looked into it, 
nor do I know how long they were there before I saw it. But I do know that the thing was smart enough to know how humans see, and where the grey corridor was from my viewpoint. This happened when I was still in preschool. When I was little, I went to this Baptist church from preschool. I seriously hated going there, because I'm pretty sure the principal hated my guts. But that's another story. They were pretty close to a very nice park, so they would take us there on field trips every once in a while. When we were on these trips, we were not allowed to leave the fenced-in playground at the park because it'd be too much work to actually watch us instead of letting us run wild. The park was composed of about three playgrounds, but only one of them had fencing. Since it was a public park, we couldn't be the only people in the fenced-in area. Most of the time it was homeschool kids, other preschools and the occasional family taking their kid to the park while we were on our break. Every now and then, there'd be an after-school program, or a man reading the newspaper, or a confused guy who'd mistaken the fenced-in area for a dog park. Then, there was the ferret guy. I'm not very sure how ferret guy got on the playground, or why he wanted to be on the playground. All I know is that he had a live ferret, and that he was keeping it in his jacket, and he looked pretty rough. Now since we were bored kids, and Ferret Guy had pretty adorable small animals hidden in his jacket, we all sort of swarmed to him to get a good look at the adorable creature. Now here's where it gets weird. We started asking why Ferret Guy was carrying his pet ferret around with him, to which he replied that he and the ferret actually worked at the playground. Apparently, what the job involved was sending the ferret down slides to look for loose bolts, and investigating the playground equipment for electrical wires. This struck me as a little weird, but I didn't really get to ask questions about it, because after an hour of ignoring us, the daycare workers suddenly noticed that all the kids were talking to a crazy homeless guy with a ferret. He gave them pretty much the same story, which led them to basically saying, Okay, let's just let creepy ferret guy get back to work. Not entirely sure what happened to Ferret Hobo, but I'm pretty sure he was off his meds, but he was gone by the time we left. Who knows if that situation would have gone south, and what would have happened if they hadn't have noticed sooner. This is one of the things that I remember almost as if it happened yesterday. I'm from Mexico, so as you can imagine, there are a lot of folklore slash legends from around these parts. This event happened a year ago. I don't remember my age, but I was probably around eight, and I am now 19. As a kid, I was very scared of the paranormal, and I can recall a couple of times, something of the matter happening to me, but I have no proof, only vivid memories. At the time, I was quite friendly with the neighbour's kid. I even stayed in their house a few times, and did some travelling with them. There was one time we went to a little village called Chelma, that is known for being very religious, and having religious migration there. So we usually went to pray and then wash ourselves with the water from a special kind of tree, an awete. Either way, on the road to the village, there's a fairly dense forest of pines, and being the shy person that I am, I usually just look out the window. And after a few minutes just watching the trees, I saw a big black silhouette that was about two meters tall. It had red glowing eyes like a canine that you would expect from a werewolf. At first, I thought I was seeing things, so I just kept turning my head and checking my vision. The road we were going on meant that we were travelling at about 50 miles an hour, and going at this speed didn't make things look like we were travelling very fast. I kept watching it for two minutes, then it turned its eyes at me, looked at me, and as soon as I did, 
I reached for my friend and told him to look that way. He said there was nothing, but when I looked back, it was there. This happened at least three times until it just disappeared. I didn't tell anyone this story until years later. I thought it could be a Nawal or something like that, but there's the absence of proof. I'm kind of skeptical about this, but I'd love to hear anyone's opinions on what it could be. Most newspapers, you know, publish strong, solid facts for the most part. While I was out in Mexico, I was reading a newspaper. And as I got to a few pages in, did I read something shocking? This newspaper had published a paranormal account of a woman. Allegedly, she and her family were living in a house that her father owned many years ago. There was a well in the house, and it was well known folklore that in that well, there resided creatures. Fey, dwarves, call them what you will, but they lived there. So as the story goes, one day, for whatever reason, a member of the family disturbed the well. And since then, terrible happenings happened to the family. Stuff would go missing, children would get sick, animals would become terrified of going outside and misbehave. And generally, people were not having a good time. Hearing disembodied voices and having night terrors, waking up screaming in the middle of the night. When her father came over to inspect the family, he realized that the well had been disturbed and that the creatures were coming out. This was terrible. By disturbing these ancient creatures, they had summoned havoc into their household and it wouldn't stop until the creatures were appeased. So they got together an offering, put it at the base of the well and fixed the disturbance. And within a day or so, everything stopped and the family went back to normal. Now this, of course, is an interesting experience to say the least. But the greater picture in question is the fact that it was published in a newspaper with an accompanying image of the well. Does this mean that folklore plays a greater part in some parts of the world and things that people often dismiss as lies in other countries and cultures are considered and simply well known as true and out of our knowledge. I was a Girl Scout for many years. During the summer camp, the counsellors would often do this thing called the 12 hours, where they'd basically send you alone into the woods with a pack of supplies, some tarps and a rope and you'd have to make your own shelter and fire and stay overnight in the woods. This was an activity only reserved for the older scouts, of course. So upon being given a spot to set up camp, I made a makeshift shelter in between two pine trees. It looked pretty snazzy and everything went well. Then I tried to fall asleep in my shelter, my head resting near the pine trees. I was woken up in the middle of the night to the feeling of something crawling on my face. I woke up with a jolt as a daddy long legged spider crawled off me into the pine trees. I have no idea why I did this, but young 12 year old me thought, I'm going to see where that thing's going. I shined my flashlight at the tree and that night I learned something very significant. Daddy long legs live in pine trees. The tree my head was resting on was covered in hundreds upon hundreds of them. All of those spiders. The two trees I used to build my shelter were practically a mating ground. I refused to build my shelter near pine trees after that. My dad's uncle and his family live in rural Louisiana but not too rural in a way. Anyway, both my dad, my brother and I traveled there. And I came here when I was younger. So it was nothing new. 
and I was around 15 at the time. The second day rolls around and it's 4am at night. I begin to start hearing an eerie sound that sounded like a trumpet, but I was too tired, fell back asleep and thought nothing of it. Now the third day is when stuff gets weird. While my dad and uncle went out to buy groceries, it was just me and my brother, and my dad's aunt at the house. So being smart intellectuals, we decide to go off down the woods off a beaten trail until we see a big, ragged white house on the other side of the swamp. It looked fairly abandoned, so we go around the lake and see a bunch of old cars with motors running. We immediately go back and tell my aunt, and she thinks nothing of it. That night, we heard loud screaming and chanting coming from the direction of the house. It starts getting closer and closer, until we see a bunch of hillbillies around our house with lighters and small torches. I'm freaked the hell out and proceed to hide. In Louisiana, hillbillies with torches who tell you to evacuate the area are best listened to. So my aunt does as told, and we think they're gonna loot the house. So my aunt and older brother go up to their supposed leaders of this group of 20 to 30 people and ask what's happening. They claim their son has been taken and transformed into a Rougarou, which is like a werewolf standing up. The next day, their son is found brutally ripped apart, with claw marks and slashes all over his body. Yeah, never again. At the elementary school I went to, there was a tradition for 5th and 6th graders to take a long day trip to Baltimore and Pittsburgh. I can't for the life of me remember which grade went into which place, but that's unimportant. The trip would start around 4 in the morning, and we would typically get home around 1 or 2 the following morning. This encounter happened on the way home from one of these trips. We were maybe an hour and a half away from the school. We would be dropped off to our parents and guardians. Anyway, earlier in the night, we'd made a pit stop at a restaurant for dinner. There was a guy that had been eating at the same time as us. I didn't see him myself, but apparently he'd been watching the students very intently for the entire time. From what I was told, he was probably middle-aged or a little younger and generally he didn't look like a creep, but his behavior proved otherwise. When the group finished eating and started to load back onto the bus, this man finished up his meal and packed up as well. From there, he followed us out of the restaurant parking lot, and for about the next hour down the stretch of highway, he basically played chicken with our bus. He would swerve in and out of the lanes ahead of us at turns, slow down, speed up, and was generally being very creepy and dangerous. Like I said, this happened for about an hour of him basically circling the bus and making it very difficult and nerve-wracking. I don't know why it took so long, but eventually one of the teachers decided to call the police and report him. At this point, we were on a stretch of highway that was familiar, and we were very close to home. Almost as if the man knew one of the teachers had called the cops, he sped up ahead of us and pulled off the highway to a small building. As we pass by, we watch him get out of his car and head towards the building entrance, all the while staring intently at our passing bus. The place he pulled off at was an adult world. I guess he'd had enough of playing chicken and wanted to choke it instead. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I now know I used to see as a child, when I was around seven or so. A gnome. It wouldn't even have been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up to my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard, a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window frolicking about in the garden and along the window sill outside. I'd sometimes see him in his silhouette through the blinds 
if they were closed on a sunny day. Parents obviously always brushed it off as the silly nonsense kids come out with when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly. Ah, oh, you never did. Never pay any attention to them. Why would they? I even remember my father saying something to my mum like, we don't even have a garden though. And she responded that it was just an act of imagination. I lived there till I was 18 or 19. I don't even think anyone in our street owned a garden gnome at all. He never even looked at me, like he didn't even know I was watching, or perhaps he didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I've never spoken to it with anyone but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked my mum, she still remembers me talking about it when I was little. I know that most people think that this is probably a load of rubbish, but I promise you it's true. Was he real, or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind? Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff, and on more than one occasion? Has this ever happened to anyone? Just so you know, this happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp. Every week, I had to take a big group of campers to a secluded spot for their wilderness survival badge, where they had to build a shelter out of sticks and leaves and sleep in it overnight. The spot in question was only about a half mile from the main camp, but we took them a circuitous route that made it seem really secluded. Anyway, on this one night in 2004, all the campers had made their shelters. We had cooked dinner and were all just sitting around the campfire. It was getting late, maybe 11 or so, so I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night and started cleaning up the fire. That's when we heard in the distance what sounded like church bells. They were pretty faint, but myself and my fellow staffers could definitely hear them. They went on for about 30 minutes, ringing every 30 seconds or so. We were a little creeped out as there were no churches or towns within 20 miles of us. After the bell stopped though, the singing started. It was too faint to hear the words, but it sounded like a church music choir, but a lot of people, and a lot more enthusiastic. Also, it was almost midnight at this point. The singing went on for well over an hour, sometimes quieting down until we almost couldn't hear it, sometimes getting so loud we thought it was getting closer. All of the campers were super creeped out, but I lied to them, telling them there was a church service going on in camp and that there was nothing to be scared of. Eventually, at almost 1am, the singing stopped. I found out a few days later that there had been a large KKK rally only a few miles away that night. And that is what we heard. This happened to my parents, and if anyone has any theories on what this could be, I'd love to hear from you. So basically right now, my family is living in the house my dad grew up in. One time, I asked my dad if he had any paranormal experiences, and after a bit of thinking, he remembered this story. When my dad was young, he said he woke up late in the night needing water, so he got up to go to the kitchen to get some. Right as he turned into the entrance of the kitchen, he looked in and by the toaster he saw a little man of about 12 inches high, peering into the toaster. He described him as looking very old with white hair and a wrinkly face. As soon as the man noticed my dad, he disappeared, like there one second gone the next. My dad doesn't know how to explain it, other than maybe he imagined it. The next bit makes me think it might not have been his imagination. I asked my mum the same question, if she had any previous paranormal experiences in the house. I kid you not, this is what she said. She said one morning she walked into the kitchen and by the toaster, 
which was on the other end of the counter from when my dad experienced this. There was a little old man. She said that when she saw him, he laughed and disappeared. My jaw kind of dropped, and I asked her to show me roughly how tall he was, and she motioned 12 inches. At that point, I thought it was a joke, but I told her that my dad had a very similar experience, and she actually looked a little spooked. I asked if she had any knowledge of my dad's experience, and she said no. I then told my dad about it, and he thought I was making it up. They both had never told each other. After this whole thing, I researched about the little people and came across the brownies, which are apparently house fairies. I don't know what to think of them though. I was car camping with friends on the Oregon coast at a designated site in the woods. While I was carrying firewood, our camp neighbor came up and offered to help, and then introduced himself to the group. We invited him over for a beer, and it turns out his name was Jason, and he was a retired boat cook who used to work on fishing ships in Alaska, but now he's traveling the west coast and staying in campgrounds. Jason was kind of a quiet guy, but as the night went on, he started to get a bit off, acting suspiciously, not really interacting with anyone, staring off into space, and then getting up, walking two steps and sitting down again. It started to get pretty late, and we were all getting ready to go to bed. I usually sleep outside in a sleeping bag without a tent, unless it's raining or something. So I set up my sleeping bag a little ways away from the fire and pass out. I woke up to Jason standing over me with a weird look on his face and my friends freaking the hell out. It turns out they all thought he stumbled back over to his campsite, but instead he went over to me and started stumbling slash trying to roll me out of my sleeping bag. I was super pissed off at this point and tired and we kicked him out of our campsite while I went to sleep in my friend's tent. Now at this point, I feel that I have to say that these might seem like warning signs, but the Pacific Northwest has some very strange and unstable people. So we honestly didn't think much of it beyond some weirdo getting too drunk and perhaps lost. The next day we all piled into a car to explore the town. And as we leave, we see Jason sitting at his campsite, just staring at a lantern across from him. We're gone for about three hours. And when we return, Jason is still there, staring at this lantern. We were all making dinner later, when he comes over to our camp with a bottle of vodka and apologized for being so weird the night before. My friend accepted his apology and offered him a burrito, and Jason proceeds to start drinking the vodka and eating with us. Completely different guy. He seems really embarrassed and sorry for the night before. As the night progresses, he's getting quiet again, but I honestly thought at this point perhaps he's just down on his luck. Maybe a touch of alcoholism, and probably pretty harmless. Plus, he wouldn't take a hint to leave. After dinner, I was sitting on a log with my back to the woods, facing the fire, and my friends were all arranged around the campfire on chairs on the other side. Jason was sitting on the log next to me on my right, between me and the group. We're all having a great time and laughing, and as the night goes on, Jason is getting progressively more quiet and seems really angry. Around midnight, I glance over and notice that he's mumbling under his breath. Now I'm the only one close enough to him to sense this change, and I start to try to figure out what he's saying. I follow his gaze and notice that he's staring intently at the axe to the left of me. I didn't want to spook him by moving, but it's about this time that I hear what he's saying, 
and he's talking about stabbing us all with his knife, over and over again. He's got this really glazed look, as he says that he's going to end us. I lock eyes with my friends across the fire, and he notices that something is really wrong and stands up, and I grab the axe and run as fast as I can to the other side of the fire. Jason gets up and starts to run towards us, and my friend, who's a big guy, grabs a hold of him while my other friends take his knife from him. We debated packing up and leaving, but ended up escorting him back to his campsite, and sitting in the car until morning when we could report it. The next day at sunrise, when I head over to the camp ranger station, I noticed Jason was completely gone, with all his stuff, even though he'd already paid for six more days. I've done my share of deeper backcountry stuff, and seen bears, heard strange noises, and was stalked by a cougar more than once. But to this day, the only experience I've had in the woods that made me wish I had a gun, was this one. I live in Mexico, a country well known for its rich culture. However, many foreigners don't know about Mexico's paranormal scene. I work as an English teacher, and sometimes I include conversation topics as part of my activities in the class. It is very common for Mexicans to start talking about paranormal stuff at school. There are even teachers who share their experiences from time to time. So. I decided to include a conversation about the paranormal in my class. As I expected, participation in the class rose, and everyone wanted to share their own experiences. Seeing that this activity was amusing and highly effective, I decided to repeat it in many of my groups. I got experiences about ghosts as usual, but something new came across. Nowales. Some people declare that things happened to them, and others claimed that some things happened to friends or relatives. Nawales are people who can transform into animals, or maybe animals who can transform into animal humans, who knows. An experience with a Nawal is pretty much the same as always. People are having fun at night, might be at a party or just outside their home, and then someone comes seeking problems. It looks like a drunkard who just wants to fight or steal things, but after feeling threatened, it changes its shape. The most common animal tends to be a dog. I'm shocked by the fact that many people just told me this. This isn't on TV or over the internet. Bear in mind, my students are old folks who are engineers now, and I go to their companies and teach them English. So I have the opportunity to speak about this with people from different backgrounds of all walks of life, who certainly don't know each other. Even one of my students told me about how a friend got traumatised after seeing a man transform into a dog, and how this friend couldn't speak for three days, because he was in shock. Let it be known, that a lot of crazy stuff happens within this country. It was our second year in our new house in the suburbs, specifically in the Philippines, Cagayan de Oro City. I was eight years old when I first discovered that the thing I thought just exists in stories was actually true, and I experienced it. It was a Sunday afternoon when we were told to get our butts moving because we were going to go to the mall. I was excited and happy that after a long weekend, I could go to spend a day at the mall playing at the arcade, so normally I would get too excited and active. I took a shower, and was so loud and noisy, and little did I know, stuff was about to hit the fan. I was asking my babysitter if she saw where my shirt was, and she pointed it out to my left side. And when I tried to look towards where my shirt was, my head slowly tilted to the right. I didn't bother it at first, and naturally I tried to move my head straight, but, to my inconvenience, 
A very sharp pain took my neck, slowly and slowly. I couldn't do anything but tilt my head to the right. I shouted to everyone in the house for help, and my babysitter rushed to me. At first she thought I was joking, till she realised that I was in pain. So what we did was go to my grandma's sister to check on me, and she replied, Itim na duende. She was annoyed by my antics, that I was too noisy, so slapping me was enough to make me realise my rudeness. A duende is a dwarf-like creature in Filipino folklore. From what I remember, there are two types of them, the ones that are mostly good, and the evil types. And to my stupid luck, I pissed off one of the bad ones. After we visited my grandmother's sister, we eventually went into the mall. I ate KFC, and I specifically remember what I ate. It was spaghetti. I think they only serve that in the Philippines, by the way. After that, we went home. A few days later, I can tilt my head a bit further to the other side, and look like a normal person again. My mum heard what happened to me, and told my babysitter to offer a black native chicken as a peace offering for my misdeeds. Then the day after, I was back to normal. After the encounter, we let our house be blessed by a Magnamont, a witch doctor, but specialising in healing instead of hurting and nothing bad paranormal ever happened there again.